hereby call the Wednesday, May 10 meeting of the Kansas State Board of Education to order. Note that all board members are present and seated. May I have a motion to approve today's agenda? Betty. Second. Kathy. Thank you. All in favor? Raise your hand. That's unanimous. This morning we are going to recognize the 2022 Blue Ribbon Schools. Welcome, Denise Kaler. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so today we're going to recognize our 2022 National Blue Ribbon Schools. Uh, we had three of them. And just as a reminder, the recognition is based on the schools. There's, there's two different areas. It's either the school's overall academic performance or progress in closing achievement gaps among student um, subgroups. So each of our attendees today, our schools were recognized for their exemplary high achievements. Um, so today we're going to hear from, we have represented today Cottonwood Elementary School, uh, Andover USD 385, uh, Principal Sherry Rooks and Superintendent Brett White along with Sophie Davis are here. We also have Morris Elementary School, Geary County USD 475, Dr. Eggleston Superintendent, and Christina Martin, our team, uh, team leader and ELL teacher here today. And then finally, we have R.L. Wright Elementary School, Sedgwick USD 439 with Principal Julie Scott, and she has some guests with her as well. So we will start off, looks like we're starting off with R.L. Wright. Good morning, I'm Julie Scott and I'm the principal at R.L. Wright Elementary. I have with me two of my fabulous teachers. Paula Knapper teaches fourth grade in our building and has for quite some time. And Candy Gardner is one of my interventionists who's taught a plethora of different um, grades, but both of them have been with R.L. Wright longer than I have. This is my fifth year here and you guys. This is my 24th year. Okay. This is my 19th. <laughs> yes. Started when she was 30. <laughs> okay, well, we'll let Candy get us going. Yeah, um, go ahead and. Yeah, just click. There. And please make sure you speak right into that microphone okay. so that they can hear you online. Yeah, I'll move this up. Yeah, we. Um, this is RA Light Elementary. Uh, we have a total of two, about 286 students that we serve, we have, we have pre-K through sixth grade. Um, we're about 49% free and reduced lunch, school lunch, and um, I think that's a little higher right now, but um, we also 18% uh, special education, um, and our school offers 19, it's about a 19 to one student teacher ratio and um, we have about a 96% attendance rate at our school. Um, there are some, er the areas that we think um, make a big difference for us and set us apart from others are our relationships, that we put relationships first in our schools. We have a strong MTSS program. Um, we have reevaluated and um, and have a strong core curriculum, and we come. We have a small community that we live in, and it is um, we are very closely connected with our community. And that makes us strong. We also have a, a strong, positive staff culture. Um, one of the things that we really focused on um, in the last few years um, is our relationships. Um, greeting the students, we have started every morning, there'll be at least two adults that will greet the students as they come in. So we say good morning to them, make sure that they're starting their day off right, um, catch any of those tears early and try to turn those around. So we do that. We have a morning greeter every morning that 
welcomes the kids right out of their car all the way up to the front door. Um, we have a FAB, which stands for Family Activity Building. Activity Building. Fab. I just call it FAB. <laughs> um, um, it's an acronym for Family Activity Building, and it's a group that we meet with um, once a month. Um, I have ten students. There's 28, 27 groups maybe, and each group has 10 students that they work with. They range from kindergarten to sixth grade in our building, and they meet with me once a month, and we do activities together. So they always have an adult or a teacher that they can relate to through their entire period that they go through that school. Um, Did you keep your fab students? Yeah, we keep our fab students, and we work with them, and we get to know them. One-on-one, -on -one, I've got some Henri little kindergartners up to a sixth grader that will be moving on. And so when we go to his promotion that's coming up Friday, uh -huh. um, then we will be able to wish him well and hopefully he'll come back as and work with the kids as he gets older. Um, that we have a small district. Um, we're K-12, pre-K-12 in one building. Um, we're under construction right now, but it's going to be great next year. Um, and so we get to see, I get to see all the kids that I've taught until they graduate. And as they enter high school, they, a lot of them come over and mentor small kids and they work in the classroom. So my fab student um, or family member will be tugged on by me to come back and work with kids um, as he gets older. And so it's a relationship that you build with one person. You watch them grow all the way through just like mom and dad would. So I enjoy that. Um, personally, um, I've had kids that I've taught in kindergarten, watched them graduate, and I've also had them come back as a student teacher. So that to me is small town community and it works well. Um, we have high school mentors. We have um, groups set up different ways. We have what we call a bigs group where um, we have high school kids that are connected with lower grade kids and they come over and see them once a week and they build relationships. So relationship basis is huge in our school. It's one thing that we do well. All right. Oh, oops. I didn't know you'd gone back. Let me go back. Sorry. All right. Um, I have been principal here for five years and um, kind of one of the things that I heard when I talked to staff members before I even started was we're kind of all on our islands, we're kind of doing our own thing. So what we've done is really take to, taken a look at good, quality, rigorous, research-based curriculum and have made it system-wide, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it, it, it's so big, especially when there's lots of pieces um, being taught in, at various levels. And so I think that has been a huge key to our success. Um, we use good instructional practices. Um, we've done, been through Kagan training, a lot of cooperative learning, a lot of how to work together and um, to help kids be able to grow in their instruction. And then systems alignments. Uh, one of the things that we did not have in place was a problem solving team or some sort of GEI team. Um, and so our teachers know how to take those kids to GEI team and get help and get support. And we have a great support team that um, helps them as well. Um, MTSS is fairly new in our district. Um, five years ago was kind of the the time that they were going through that process when I came on board, we do a complete walk to intervention program where all of our kids are getting exactly what they need. We can enrich. Oftentimes we spend a lot of time work, working with our lower students, but we can't forget to move those higher students as well. And so our walk to intervention program is um, every, it's called what I need time, win time, and the kids just go to wherever they need to go. Um, and you might have 10 third grade groups going or 10 third and fourth grade groups going at the same time. So we really try to meet the kids where they're at. Um, at the same time, we have two certified interventionists who help support our tier three and tier two students. One of them is Mrs. Gardner. Um, and along with MTSS, we were able to bring FastBridge in. And um, so I feel like we have a really great, consistent, ongoing, data-driven instruction 
and the teachers have time during PLCs to look at that data and to really hone in on what the needs of every student, um, of each student. Oh, I want to go back one, sorry. I did also, something else I wanted to mention, the bottom picture, um, well, it's on my left. I guess there's everywhere. Um, we also use our teacher leaders a lot. I have a tremendous staff, and we've really tried to, that is them presenting. Our, um, I had six different groups of teachers present at Back to School In Services on different topics that they do really well to share. I mean, some of the best things we have going on are right next door, and we don't get to see them very often. So um, we really have stepped up that in the last few years as well. Um, Mrs. Knapper mentioned community connectedness. I think this is huge for our district. Um, we just passed a bond issue about a year ago, year and a half, that was two-thirds um, majority. It wasn't one or two votes that it passed by. It passed significantly. Our community supports the schools. Um, we have a little coffee shop called The Meeting House that really supports our school. Mondays after school, you can see. They have uh, Meeting House Mondays for the kids. They go down and get a snack after school. Sometimes they have activities where they'll make cards for the veterans or something like that. Um, that has been a huge, they also are a great uh, support for us. We get coffee and donuts and things um, just for our teachers because we've got a good partnership. Uh, they have a stage, so our kids will come down and read poetry to their patrons sometimes or share a story. Um, there's lots of different things that we've tried to build within that. And our high school kids actually volunteer. They um, do community service hours and volunteer hours at the meeting house. So there's really only one paid employee. The rest of it is volunteers, and a lot of our high school kids do that. Um, we raised money through our PTO and our board to build a playground, or to get a new playground. And instead of having a company come and install it, we had one man who knew what he was doing and had the tools, and we invited the whole community to come out, and we built the playground in one day. We've done that twice now, two different areas, and we had over 50 people from the community, some who didn't even have students. So I really believe that community connectedness is really important in our building. Um, our fab projects, that once a month we meet, sometimes we'll do, well, at Christmas we walk down and sing Christmas carols at the nursing home. So there's a lot of, we make cards for different people. Um, we've even, one of our goals is to rake yards for people in the community um, down the road. So we've talked about that. We do a traditional Halloween parade down to Diversicare, which is our nursing home down the road. They love, they bring all their um, uh, guests out and they watch us, so that's nice. This year we started a COPPA lunch, so our, what we're noticing is our, we do have a lower socioeconomic and, um, area within our community where our kids were seeing police in a not so positive light. So one of our local officers approached me and we set up a program to where he comes in every Tuesday and he brings pizza lunch. Teachers nominate a student each um, week to have lunch with um, Officer Josh and it's just trying to get that the police in a positive light for all of our kids. Um, and it really helps. We've seen some good things and it's only been since January that we've seen that, so. Um, team building is huge in our district and um, like Julie said when she came here, um, we all felt like we were on our own little separate islands because you go in your classroom and that's it, you're in your classroom the entire day. So we don't really get to visit and talk with other fellow workers. So um, some of our in-services, we have gotten to know each other. She'll put us in a group with people that from K-12. Um, I could be grouped with some high schoolers and junior high um, teachers and we do a scavenger hunt um, and we take pictures and we have fun. Um, we went bowling on one in-service and got to do some bowling. We tried to do fun things together to build relationships with our with our staff and that that helps to break that ice so you can go over and say hey I've got this how would you put this together so we are starting to do more cross and asking we have we have good teachers 
So we have people that we can go to to say, I want to do this in my class. How can I put this together? And you can bounce good ideas off of. You don't have to go to class and learn how to do it because I've got a teacher right there that can show me how to do it. So we have been doing a lot of that. Um, we have fun with our kids. Um, Before you go on to that, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. But I just want to share an example that happened just a couple of weeks ago with that. Our high school advanced biology teacher contacted our second grade class mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have even hardly known each other had we not been doing some of this um, group. But our, the high school kids um, needed to talk about different parts of the animals and the animal life cycles and the things that they had been doing. So they asked the second graders if they could partner on a field trip to the zoo where the, the high school students took the students around to the different exhibits and talked them through those different exhibits and asked them questions and the kids asked questions back. And so that was just, it was something that happened because we're building that staff collaboration. And I just thought that was a really cool thing. So being on the same campus, it's great because we can have high schoolers come over and work with our kids and talk about helping us out. I mean, we don't have enough paras to go around, but we have high schoolers that are willing and able and they love working with the smaller kids and they're great mentors. And it's the kids see them in the hallway or out on the football field. And it's like, hi, they get real excited to be able to say hello to them. So it's, it's, it's great fun. And, and the community culture in our school district and between the community outside has been changing. We've been putting groups together where we talk about what we want to do in the future and involving retirees and those type of people and getting them involved in the school has been huge and we've been doing a great job at that. It's been good. Did we get to all of it? Okay, I think that's it. I hope we didn't take too long. Do you guys have any questions or anything? Thank you very much. I do see a question from Betty. Okay. Actually, it's not a question, but this is a perfect opportunity to congratulate you on what you're doing. I mean, it is so, it's so heartwarming. Oftentimes I've, I've heard of the concern that uh, teachers are saying, we, 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 we are teaching to a test when it's data-driven instruction and MTSS. I don't know how that statement can be made unless you're doing one instead of the other. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of of what you're doing, and I love that idea, um, the the cop lunch or cop to lunch or whatever, because cop a lunch, mm -hmm. because you're so on point when you make the statement that many kids uh, don't see officers in the vein of real people or someone that we can relate to, yes. and you're giving them that unique opportunity, also. Uh, I've heard concerns of, we're not teaching kids civics. And when I listened to your entire presentation, it wasn't just an isolated subject. It's how we can incorporate this on, uh, whether we're doing cards or singing Christmas carols or mm -hmm. connecting you with the community and, and identifying with your needs. I absolutely love your approach. I congratulate you, and I can tell just when you were talking that you are so interested in the success of your students. You're doing all of those things to create that environment. It's so heartwarming. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's not a question, but I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you again. Thank you. And Dennis. Hey, thanks for getting up early and coming. Like, I know what that drive's <laughs> like. <clears throat> I just have to say thank you for uh, uh, representing. Uh, Greg invited me, your superintendent, to come in before I took uh, was active on the board, and he reached out to me, and I really appreciated that. And I plan on coming back and seeing yes. seeing you guys on Please. campus there because I'm really curious of how this is working out. Right. Absolutely. And you're doing a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. And hopefully we won't be quite as much of a mess because the bond will be finished next year and you're welcome anytime, anyone. So, Got a couple more for you. Sure. We'll go to Ann. We'll go to 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The concept of the multi-age family groups mm -hmm. was one that when we first started redesign and the seven Mercury schools came in, six of the seven were doing multi-age family groups because the whole thing about you got to take care of Maslow before bloom can happen and, you know, we get criticism sometimes for dealing with SEL, but I'd like to hear more from you guys about how using social emotional learning improved your academics. Mm. That's a great question. You guys want to speak? You want me to? Um, I think, um, personally, I think social emotional learning gets a bad rap because it is so much of just meeting kids where they're at and letting them know you care about them. And letting them know that, you know, teach, how do you teach somebody to persevere? Um, how, life is hard and we have to give them ways and coping strategies in how to deal with life as a bigger picture. I think what it's done, I think there's been multiple things that, that it's done, but it has united us as a school around these kiddos who struggle. Mm -hmm. And it one of the great side effects of it is it allows every kid in our building to be a leader. When they're in fifth and sixth grade, we depend on them in our fab families. They, um, they lead, because not every kid's a leader in class, but in fab they are. And so you see some of those quieter, more timid kids who are more withdrawn. In fab, they have people looking up to them. They are the big kid, and it, that has been really a very cool aspect. I actually had um, Fab in my previous district at mm -hmm. Circle. We were um, we started it mm -hmm. over there, and I had kids in junior high and high school come back and say um, that other people treated them kind, more kind. They would be like, um, "Don't don't mess with him. He's cool. He's my he was my Fab brother." Right. You know, just things like that to teach kids that we're all different, we're all different grades, we're all different, we have different needs, but we, together, we can always go farther. Great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you guys have any, anything have to add? Experience. Okay. I have um, my sixth grader. Um, I've had him a couple times because um, I've moved grade levels, and he's a tough kid. And this year has been fantastic and he is my one of my leaders in my fab group and he watches out for the kindergartner he is always there first thing by my door do I need to go get him I said that'd be great and he makes sure he's where he's supposed to be what he's supposed to be doing they sit together and color and they have conversations and sometimes he'll look over at me and he'll go did you just hear what he just said? And I said, yeah, does that remind you of anybody? And he's like, mm-hmm. So, I mean, he's developed and grown, and he is enjoying that opportunity to take to talk to a little one, and he's doing a really good job. I can't wait to see what he does in the future. So it's fun. The other piece of that also is we are able to encourage kids. It's amazing how many kids get into high school and they think, oh, maybe I do want to be a teacher. And they've been in champs, they've been in fab, they've done bigs, they've done a lot of different things. And now we're creating pathways for them in high school to come and um, do some teaching right across the hallway. So it's, that's pretty, un, pretty cool. Thank you. Uh-huh. And Jim. Congratulations. And thank you for all the work you did to receive this award. But also, thank you for all the work you did to fill out the application. How long did that take you? Um, well, we had a team. I, I oh, shared with, have a team. <laughs> with six people, and um, they we each divided it up, and it took us a couple of months and a lot of proofing and things, but um, I, they were so excited to be honored. I, every teacher, I know how hard teachers work, and it's nice to be recognized for that work, um, so it was a real honor for us. Well, and Mrs. the work you did in doing it helped you understand your system even better. You're exactly right. Yeah, mm -hmm. but what did you learn in Washington? Mm. Mrs. Learn? Gardner, what did we learn in Washington? Okay. <laughs> uh, I can say that some of the best learning that I got in Washington was in some of the small groups. We had breakout sessions, and you got to pick. They just had big signs on the table, and you picked, you know, if you're, you were interested in social-emotional learning, 
Everybody who sat down at the table, we just started asking each other questions. This How is do all you the do this? other schools that won the award as well. Yes, all the Blue Ribbon so schools. Yeah. yeah. And so we got lots of great ideas from visiting with other schools about how they do things. So, Yeah, so you can go to Washington and learn something. And oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, congratulations, and uh, uh, thank you for the hard work you did, and uh, thank you for your modeling and sharing your experiences, you know, so others can learn from it. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Morris Hill Elementary School in Geary County with Dr. Eggleston and Christina Martin. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you again. Our principal, Ms. Burgess, is unable to be with us. She has jury duty this morning, so <laughs> she sent us uh, instead, and so... Uh, we are just honored to stand before you and just share a few things with us, with you. Uh, Ms. Martin serves as our team leader and ELA teacher, so really appreciate the leadership that she provides. So Morris Hill Elementary School is one of five schools on our Army Post, Fort Riley. And it's amazing at the progress and their commitment because of the transition that they experience with students on an annual basis and yet they are still able to have a good pulse or a thumb on the academic achievement of their students, which is a model and an example throughout our district. Uh, we try to make data uh, the driving force and what's behind our decisions each time we sit down at the table so that we're ensuring that we're addressing the academic needs of all of our students. And as you know, there's a great deal of emphasis on closing the achievement gap with all of our subgroups as well. And so they have done an outstanding job of looking at that data and using data in order to make those decisions and develop action steps that will support and help all of our students. So I'm going to turn it over to you for comments, and I'll jump in as needed. Okay. okay. So um, we have been serving a military family since 1957. I am, um, my husband's retired military, and we decided to stay in Kansas after he retired because that's where my children grew up and um, it's become home. And so they went through our district from K through 12 and now I have a six year old going through it too. Um, so families arrive to us from all over the world. We have 43 languages in our district, 90% um, active military at this time. There's a 59% student mobility rate. So it's really difficult to keep a a thumb on those children, but we need to make sure that as they arrive to us, we meet them at their needs. Um, <clears throat> supporting 250 students in early childhood through fifth grade, so that's our building. Um, we have won the Purple Star previous, uh, no, we are Purple Star Community School. <clears throat> so we um, pair up with the military to do um, military um, things. Um, <laughs> we have been National Blue Ribbon in 2007 and also in 2022. Okay, um, so like the other school, which was amazing, we do a lot of things that are familiar with, uh, similar to them. Um, we do intentional collaboration with parents and families. We have lots of community activities. We have bingo night, chili night, um, and all kinds of activities. Halloween parades, Veterans Day, um, and things to bring in the families. Um, the number one thing is MTSS early intervention. So we do um, fast bridge, we do a lot of um, assessing to get to see where the students are so that we can meet them at their need. We do differentiated instruction for math and ELA small groups. So after we teach whole group to all the students, we meet them in their needs. So if they're tier one, tier two, tier three, they are all receiving the same instruction but on their level. Um, we have in the past done remote and in-person learning opportunities, so that remained open during COVID to make sure we assisted all the students. Like Dr. E said, we are data-driven. We have weekly PLCs. Um, like the other school, we every week is designed to a certain um, area, so reading, math, social, emotional, and behavior. And we have positive learning environments. We also greet the children every morning, which I love to do. Um, as the students walk down, there's teachers at their doors, and they greet them as well. 
Um, and it makes the students feel like more of a community, not that they're just walking in the building and going to their classroom. So this is um, just a, a preview of our data, which was exciting for me because when I was teaching third grade in 2021, we um, exceeded the district and the state, so it was pretty exciting. Um, fourth grade was doing great, fifth grade. So we, we have shown that our data-driven um, instruction is meeting the needs of the students through teaching them the standards. Through our curriculum, which is also, um, we do wonders and we do um, um, I ready for math. Um, this is our science data, which last year, fifth grade blew out of the water. Um, so our proactive Panthers, we do positive referrals with parent contact. So if a teacher nominates a student, they fill out a form and it um, goes to the principal and she makes personal contact with the parents. This goes for all students, students that have behaviors and then students that are, are well behaved and parents are thrilled to hear from the principal about their student, how they are. We have meaningful jobs. Um, so um, teachers nominate their students that need a job to feel part of the community as well. So some will help the custodian at lunch, some will um, read to kindergartners, um, and all things that we target on their needs and how we can make them feel part of the community. Um, we do tickets in the classroom, so we reward the kids with tickets for good behavior, and then they can purchase things throughout the building. We have lunch um, purchases for if they want, if they win the raffle, they get a game or something for positive behavior. Um, morning and sunset classroom meetings. This has been um, one of the most important things that we have put into our daily routine. The children come in in the morning and they are greeted by their classmates. They are told they are taught a lesson on social emotional learning. Um, so they, there's a goal for the week. Our goal for the week is to be kind to others or something else that would do that. And then they talk about it every day for that week. Um, social emotional learning is also important um, for to meet the needs of all our students nowadays. We don't know what's going on at home. We can't control what's going on at home, but we can control what's going on in the classroom. Um, we have an MFLAC, which is a military family life consultant um, that comes from the military, and they have lunch bunch with the kids. They meet with some of the kids for, um, for social emotional needs. Okay, sorry, I talk really fast. Um, <clears throat> we have weekly, so our next steps, we knew what was working at the time. We did regular MCSS in the classrooms a few years ago. Now we are doing walk to intervention um, so that the students get more specific needs. We can um, group the students according to their needs and they can go to one teacher instead of um, the teacher trying to meet the needs of all the students during MTSS. So the students start beginning to walk to intervention and we have the whole building moving. We also began um, an after school program. So the kids do, um, um, learning like if for math or reading but then they have enrichment so they'll do art or um, STEM activities as well. Um, we are beginning to focus more on intentional purposeful tier one instruction because if you don't have tier one instruction then all the kids don't cannot meet those needs. Um, there's the walk to intervention. Um, we are doing peer observation so like the other school said um, we once you're in your classroom, you don't know what's going on in the other classrooms. You don't get to um, receive all that good information that the teachers are, are teaching. Um, so they're doing peer observation. So once a, a month, they're going into other classrooms and observing and, and taking notes of all the good things that are being done. And we will have a new building next year. So like yesterday, we had a bad rainstorm and we were undercover, but um, next year we'll have a brand new beautiful facility which we're all excited for. And that's, that's it. I love to, oh, go ahead. No, any questions you may have. Absolutely, I, I loved how you talked about data-driven instruction. You said we knew what was working. And I assume that that's what you mean when you're talking about data. You're talking about looking at the outcomes for students and then asking how can we continue to improve on this. And so I'm just blown away by the opportunities to get teachers together and to make that time for what are essentially PLCs, right? Yes. And, and giving them the opportunity to learn from each other. So congratulations, this is wonderful work. Um, I've got a couple for you here, Anne. Great minds, I guess, because my 
thoughts went straight to the data-driven instruction as well because I'm a big data person and I think if you don't have it, you're flying blind and there's no way you can differentiate and give every child a chance. But could you tell us a little bit about the kind of data you collect and how you use it to improve instruction? So we've been using um, FastBridge screeners. We also Is use... Is that for English and math? And FastBridge is for English. Okay. We have iReady Diagnostics for math. Okay. We do, um, in our buildings, we use 95% groups, so we also do the 95% group screeners to see what specific phonics um, skills that they're missing, and okay. we build on that. Um, so we use a variety of the screeners, and then we also use the teacher's um, input to see um, if some things were accurate and not accurate. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we use a lot of screeners, and then we get together and we we group the children according to what their, their skills are, and then we divide and conquer. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dina. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, this is really a special day to uh, have people tell us what we've been asking for is really working. So um, one of the things that kind of sets you apart is the mobility of your students. Could you kind of address how, how you deal with that issue? Um, the first thing that we do is we meet the families. So we have to get to know the families, where they come from, what district. Then we dig deeper, we get to know the children, and then we start assessing where they are. Um, so the first thing, the most important thing, is getting to know the families and the children. Um, because if they're not comfortable, they're not going to, to thrive in our, in our district. So when they the first thing they do when they walk into the building, somebody greets them, we show them around the building, we talk to the parents, we communicate with the parents, we ask for records and knowledge about the kids, the students, not the kids, um, and then we build our, our, <coughs> our knowledge from there. But they need to feel safe. I think one of the items that also goes along with that is when parents come to us from varying places, they always want to make sure that they're getting a good education. And we constantly hear that. They're coming from DOD schools. They're coming from uh, Washington, just different places. And so sitting down with them, sharing what our curriculum looks like, uh, ensuring them that they're getting a quality education, takes some of the fear out of it as well. And then they now become partners with us as we transition and move forward with our teaching and learning aspects of it. But that's been one of the challenges with the mobility is when individuals come in, uh, they may not know the Kansas curriculum or how we do things. And so getting them acclimated and orientated to what we do and how we do it is so important early on so that we can take that aspect off the table and really talk about teaching and learning. Thank you. And congratulations. I think it's really exciting. And this isn't your first time. It's my first time, but uh, not our building's first a time. Blue Ribbon School. <laughs> yes. Well, it's probably for both of you mm -hmm. <laughs> because neither one of you were here in 2007. But um, I just think it speaks highly of the efforts that are made for students who really come to you. Many of them have parents who are, are not going to be with them uh, the entire time. So, and have not been at various times through their years of school. And um, I can't imagine how, how that affects children to have their parent in a place that um, really is, is um, kind of, a, they know the danger and the risk that their parents are being placed in. And that's, 
that's something that you all can kind of calm down to. So thank you for your efforts and all that you do for every child, not just the ones that are military, but the district does excellent things for all kids. Thank you. Betty. Okay, thank you for a great presentation. Now, you are uniquely suited to answer this question because it's always, how do we stack up? With that kind of mobility and seeing kids come in from all areas, you kind of touched upon it, but um, with the, with the data-driven approach and the MTSS and, and walk to intervention, how do you think we as Kansas stack up against? Um, that would be your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick question. Yeah. <laughs> I think what we're learning is that having a program that will meet all of our students' needs is most important. Uh, we have military students who do very well on our uh, assessments, some who do not as well as our local students. Uh, but what we're finding is trying to uh, differentiate what we do so that we can keep those students who are the high flyers, I say, continuing to do well. And then we're also moving those students who may not be exactly where we desire them to be. So I'm not trying to give a politically correct answer. I'm just looking at that's the truth. We're trying to... Uh, help students move into threes and fours. And for those students who are already in threes and fours, we're trying to take them to the next level as well. A lot of our parents will come in and say, hey, I want my child to go to college. I want my child to be ready for the next experience. What will you do for us? So I think they force us to up our game in all truthfulness uh, based on expectations and based on programmatic uh, supports and recommendations that they are looking for. So I think from a state standpoint, our MTSS program is great. It's actually forcing us to look at the needs, and I think it's a good investment and something we need to continue to make a focus throughout the state. Well, actually, that was what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you do. Appreciate it. That looks like all the okay. questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations so again. Right, and our final school is Cottonwood Elementary School, and over three uh, USD three eighty five. And I think uh, Superintendent Brett White is going to introduce his staff. Good morning, Brett White, and over Superintendent. Honored to be here uh, with you this morning. We have Principal Sherry Rooks and Second Grade Teacher Sophie Davis along uh, with me this morning. Uh, I want to start maybe just by sharing a few thoughts about the, uh, the national conference. Really, when, when I came home, it was really the reflection that we have so much to be thankful for and grateful for here in Kansas. So listening and learning from, from districts from across the nation, uh, we have incredible leadership with Dr. Watson, the entire team at KSDE. Uh, the two words that come to mind, really, responsiveness, off the charts responsive. We know that you know the staff is a phone call away uh, and the professionals in there. So I left really being uh, just understanding the, the, the privilege that it is to, uh, to live and work in Kansas. Um, I think, let me just share one example. Uh, last month we had Dr. Watson, uh, Jim, and Betty, and they came and spent really the morning at our Andover Academy talking about virtual education, what the needs are, and I think just the listening and the input, uh, that's what I think helps to set Kansas apart is the, the educators, teachers, principals, uh, district people across the state hold our, our state department in the highest of regard and esteem, and I think that's not... Uh, often the case. So coming back from D.C., I think it was just that realization that we have lots to be uh, thankful for. Really, the Kansas can vision uh, that the state board and every district really champions, again, I think is, is very unique. Um, speaking of unique, proud to be here with Cottonwood Elementary. When I think of Cottonwood, um, 
it's a school, but it's really a family. Both of my kids went through Cottonwood, and, and uh, it's really a place where relationships matter. Lots of the same things, strong culture of caring uh, for, for students, for staff, and for families. Uh, as you listen to Sherry and Sophie, they've both been there um, over two decades. Many of our staff members have come to Cottonwood, and that's where they spend their, uh, uh, their careers. Uh, so it's really the high expectations, and they'll talk about some of the structures and some of the things in place, but it's really the family environment and the high expectations for all. Uh, Sherry Rooks is actually retiring after 20 years as principal at Cottonwood, 27 um, in the Andover district, and 33 in public education. Uh, but I have no doubt that the culture and the excellence of Cottonwood will continue because of people like uh, Sophie, and it's just filled with teachers who they're, they're invested and uh, just so engaged in the success for uh, Cottonwood students and, and families there. So I'm, I'm confident that tradition of excellence will continue. We will definitely miss Sherry. Uh, just one quick, quick example. She had, uh, they had a retirement uh, gathering for Sherry last Friday. And um, when I got there, there was not a parking place to, to be had. I mean, there was several hundred people there, and it was really a celebration of Sherry's leadership, but I think also just the family. I mean, these were, uh, in fact, one had come from Texas and was traveling through, and like they'd come from near and far, uh, but it was just kind of a family reunion, so to speak, as well as honoring Sherry. So it just kind of speaks to the culture and the relationships at Cottonwood. So I'll turn things over to Sherry Rooks and Sophie Davis. Thank you guys for having us today. Um, just a little bit about Cottonwood. We are actually a new, brand new building, if you count. Thank you for two decades. It's 22 years sounds much better than two decades. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we uh, got our own building in 2000. Uh, we are a K-5 elementary. We've been anywhere from 375 students over that time to 560 when Andover got to be so big. So um, we have been able to celebrate all of our kiddos that have been there. And right now we're sitting at about between 400 and 430 kids in the last couple of years. And um, we're anywhere from 18 to 30% free and reduced lunch. So um, we're, we're pretty, um, we're, we're, we've, all of our kids are just pretty there, right? They're just, we're all just floating along and we all want good schools and all of those things. Um, we're about 85% Caucasian. And Surprisingly, about 23% of our kids have a, an IEP of some sort, and I didn't count that as gifted. That's um, all the other special needs that we have. Our building has about 80 staff members in it, um, 32 certified teachers, and in, in those 32 teachers, we have 19 classroom teachers. Um, our class sizes are anywhere from 20 to 27. K2 is a little bit smaller than 3.5. Um, we have two interventionists, and I will say, as I look back on the last two years, we've always had a title, we've always been a title building, um, but and we've always had a title one reading teacher, but this last, last year and this year, we've had a math interventionist as well, and she was a former special ed teacher, and so she has knowledge in both reading and math, and both of those two ladies together are like data queens, mm -hmm. amazing, and they know reading and math. They know the standards, they know, um, they know the kids, they know good interventions, and so, Having them there and having that extra person to support our kiddos has been instrumental for us. Um, and, and they are also the keeper of the data, so teachers are able to go to them and, and ask questions of them. So that's been very helpful. We also have a, a counselor on staff. We have art, music, PE, library um, in there. So we've, we're still promoting all of those specials as well. Um, we have two and a half special ed teachers, so we're trying to keep those numbers and case sizes down. And then we have uh, a category program um, in our building, and we have three special ed teachers with that categorical program as well. So kind of a wide variety of, of teachers um, at Cottonwood. All very experienced. We just hired um, an, Andover, an Andover Central, that's the other side. So we have two of those kiddos that came through the other high school, but they're um, two brand new teachers, so Andover is promoting their own teachers as well, so we do hire people from the other side, and it's okay. They're really good They're teachers. They're really good teachers. They are. Yeah. I'm very proud of them, and they kind of know the Andover way, so it's yeah. it's a good thing. Um, I would say, as we look at that, and, and um, I didn't hear that from my colleagues, but like paraprofessionals, while we have 18 of them, they've been really hard to find, mm -hmm. um, and we have amazing paraprofessionals that work hard and really well with kiddos, and then six instructional aides in our building as well that help the interventionist, so... Um, we 
um, kind of looked at it a little different. I, 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 it's interesting how we are all very much the same in, in our schools, but we're all very a, a little bit different as well. We wanted to tell you a little bit about our celebration. Um, when we found out about the national, uh, with, uh, the recognition, we had a staff celebration. We had some blue yogurt. We had some blue pens. We all kind of wrote all of the good things. Oh, yeah, some blue sunglasses. We all kind of told about what we thought was good about Cottonwood. And so that's how we started the application process, is we had the staff do that. And then we had a big post-it note thing in the lounge. And we're like, put the good things that you see about Cottonwood in there. And so the staff, I mean, there was, they did a really nice job, and a lot of the themes were the same, like like they said, positive staff culture, um, doing things for kids, and so we used all of that to write that very long application <laughs> that you have to keep under 800 words. So thank you for asking that question. Um, it was it was a process, and we had editors and all of those things. So um, yeah, and then as we got closer, and then we 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 hurried and we waited, and then we hurried and then we waited, but. Um, it was, it was a good process for all of us to go to to make us think about what is the good things and what we're proud of most at Cottonwood. So thank you for that. Um, we did celebrate a little bit um, with some activities. And um, I, shouldn't, I should have went the other way, sorry. Uh, before I say that, Sophie was going to tell you a little bit about our DC trip. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, would, I will say that when we went to DC and it was quite an honor and it, we found out even there when they were they were telling us they're like this is a big deal and we're like yeah this is a you know we knew it was a big deal but they're like no this is a big deal you know you have done something really good here and we're like oh well this is even a little better than we thought but um so it was really exciting and I think the common theme that you'll see with these Kansas schools that are amazing and the schools that we met and talked to and collaborated with when we were in DC, we have some of the same things. The common theme is that kids first. That's what everybody was all about. You've got to build those relationships before. And these are people from New York and California and India and all over. Everybody is kids first. And that's what we have to remember always because data is amazing and it gives you everything to help these kids be the best kids that they can be. But they have to first feel loved and important. So um, that's probably the biggest thing that I came away with. And um, also the social emotional was a big thing too, making them feel like they are important, like I said before, and, and needed in that environment. So um, that was one of the really the most important things I think I came away with. So many amazing ideas and um, different strategies that schools were using that we got to use or hear and say, oh yeah, we could try that. And like they were mentioning too, where do you learn the most from? It's from the teachers. It's from the people that are in your system and in your, um, you know, nobody understands teachers like teachers, right? So that was one of the biggest things that I came away with. And I have to say, I, we got to, we got, we were there a day early, and so we got to do some sightseeing, which was really fun to think that we're in D.C. because of an award, but we are really good with the segues if anybody wants to oh, um, get yes. some tours. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we were phenomenal on that. Um, one of the things that we wanted to, to say is that we did, we celebrated, it's not about me, it's about all of the teachers and the kids in the community, and so we tried to celebrate with our kids as much as we possibly could, and so you'll see some pictures on there of some of the things that we did, we, um, we just had a week-long celebration, and um, I think the highlight for us is that it's not, you know, the award isn't for the kids that are currently there, it's, or at least some of them, you know, it's the ones that have left, so we asked some of our high school and middle school kids to come over and celebrate with us, and they tied blue ribbons on our fence, and just nice to see, and it's fun to see the kids come back and like, oh, look at the wall that we got to sign, where's my name, and, and look, talk to my teachers, and you don't know any of them. That's part of building the Andover community as well. Even though we're so big and we have six elementary schools, we're still trying to bring back our kids and, and let them be a part of our school and, and our family. So super important. And so we had blue snow cones and blue shirts. And then we had a, a gentleman come and talk to us at our assembly 
Um, and then we rolled out the blue carpet for the kids when they came in on Monday, and so they walked on that. And then we used the blue carpet a little bit later for an activity. So, But it was just fun to celebrate and recognize our accomplishments. Uh-oh. Oh, that was fun. Nobody, okay, what happened? Nobody else did that but me. There we go. Um, so what has worked? You guys have all heard about the MTSS thing. We did that training from KSD in 2011 and 12, and I will say it was hard. It was hard to look at yourself and say, Oh, yeah, we probably need to fix that. It was five days of very in-depth, oh, what can we do to change the curriculum? What do we need to, what do we do that's good with our parents? That was, a, it was rough. And so um, I'm glad that we did that all of those years ago. And, and I think we just continue to revisit that and make sure that what we are doing is working uh, for our students. And we took the system that was presented and we looked at, okay, how many kids do we have in, in each of those um, categories? And I did um, put, man, I did that again. Go ahead, so see what you can do. I'm like, that, yeah, there you go. And so I wanted to share those, um, a little bit of those results with you. That's our amazing um, people that keep track of our data for us. And as a principal or as a teacher, it's hard to put all of that. You don't have time to put all of that. So having those people that like data can put it in pretty graphs and look at it is super beneficial for us. Um, we use Dibbles still. Um, and so when our kiddos come in, they um, use Dibbles for reading. We use iReady for math, the, the diagnostic. And then as we look at Dibbles, then we use QPS and PAST to um, further dissect some of that data. So when we started the school year last year, um, last year in 21, 22, um, like in fifth grade, so what that says is that 48 of our kids were on level according to the Dibbles. And so 26 of our kiddos were in groups. As we moved through from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, you can see that data didn't change very much. And when I asked the teachers about that, I'm like, what's going on? And they're like, well, we don't want those kids that are on watch to lose it. So we're gonna keep those kids in our, in our groups. So they continue to work um, with kiddos that might struggle a little bit, but I will say that the math data is, is a lot better than the reading data. And I would also say that the reason behind that is we are starting to look for a new reading curriculum in Andover and super excited about what that entails for them for next year as they look at different programs. And then um, we, iReady is two years old in Andover and I would say that that is a very systematic, explicit uh, um, teaching program. And so I think the teachers have really bought into that and are using it a lot more. So excited to see what reading and what happens with that next. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, okay go ahead, you mouse. I'm struggling. Um, since we did a lot with redesign, I thought we would put some of that in there. So uh, we were one. Of, we weren't the first set. We were the second set. Gemini, right? Is that how that next moonshot went? And we did that training as a staff, and that was another one that kind of made us say, "Okay, let, what are we doing that's working? What do we need to change?" And I will say, um, part of my my favorite part of what we have done and what I have done as a principal is to work with the teachers and create explorations. And we talk about bringing in the community and, and how that helps. Well, our explorations came out of redesign. And what we do with that is uh, we have um, 35 spaces in the building that we can make work. And we ask our paras and our teachers and our um, some of our community members to come in and share a talent with our kids. We want us we want school to be a place to explore. That was what the data said: is give our kids some create some opportunities for them. So we have created a lot of different opportunities for our kids. Some of them, um, my fault that you know are really hard opportunities. But we have a six weeks. We meet once a week on Thursdays from eight fifty five to nine thirty five, and we share a talent. And some of those groups, it's a multi-age um, group. So we have um, about 10 to 12 kids in our groups. And we just do different things. Some of the things that we've done, building with boxes, not smart. That was mine. Um, we, uh, I forgot about cutting duct tape and letting kindergartners duct, duct, cut duct tape. Um, we have a walking group. We have Legos. We have sewing. I, I will say the nicest one probably was a knitting group that one of my teachers did. And the kids wanted to finish what they were doing, so they came in after school and worked with that teacher. Mm -hmm. So it's so cool to see those things. You see some art, an art project up there that they did. It's just nice to see them working in something other than school. So um, we try to create those opportunities for our kiddos. Um, for our student success skills, we talked about class meetings. We've been doing those for a while and made them more intentional. We use Second Step. 
we've had some read-ins where we can read with our K2 buddies or, or you know, all along the curriculum. And then we also have buddy classes, and we've been doing that for several years, so our K5 work together. And I will say the sweetest pictures that you can find as a kindergartner and a fifth grader that are out maybe finding Easter eggs in the habitat or reading together or working on a sunflower, and they, they meet every other Friday. Um, to build those relationships. Second and fourth grade work together, and then first and third, so it's it's been good. And then before COVID, I think it was all of that. We tried to do a lot of project-based learning, and COVID has kind of kicked us in the high knee a little bit, so we're getting that, uh, so we're getting back up to speed and, and hope to be throwing in some more of that project-based learning along the way, so. Anything else on that redesign? I think, I too, um, uh, the other schools are doing this as well as uh, making more um, interactions with our high school kids and our middle school kids. Uh, my students just uh, wrote some stories, uh, some animal stories, and so now our high school um, digital media. media students are turning those into um, stories for them on the computer. So they're turning their little stories into something else. So that, and then next week we're gonna go see their finished products and the kids are really super duper excited about that. Because like they also mentioned, it's just cool to have big kids mm -hmm. to look up to. And so that's really, that's a fun opportunity for them too. Oh, mouse me, there you go. We, as our, as our cumulate, well, as our, one of our pictures that we wanted to put up there, we went out on the football field with all of our blue shirts and we took a picture and um, it was a great celebration and, and it's, it's, it's good to be here today and to um, be appreciated by you guys and um, we hope that one day in five years, ten years from now, we will get to, somebody will get to be here again. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to steal Miss Davis's words and say, this is a really big deal. <laughs> All three of you schools, come on, this is a big deal. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Betty has a comment. Thank you, question. and I do have a comment. <laughs> I, I have to share because uh, uh, when we went on the tour, there's one story that I've been telling people and they look at me and I'm just bragging, you know, so. Uh, and it was about the, uh, I think it's third grader that uh, from a math perspective, this was um, um, the teacher had taught him everything. This third grader had a high school math teacher uh, because that third grader was at that level. And what that said to me is you're really paying attention to what the students need to understand that you've advanced past this. We need to bring in a high school math teacher to uh, just keep you going. I love that. I, lo I said, that's what it means to pay attention to where the students are, giving them what they need and when they need it. So uh, I had to tell that story and then I say, congratulations, keep up the good work. Any other questions or comments from board members? I just want to say thank you all again for making the trip, for creating the presentations, for doing the applications, and all of the work, and just for all of the work that you do with students every day. Congratulations again. I think we're going to do some photos.
We're not on a break. We are missing a couple of folks. Um, but Mr. Carter, you will be up next. I think if you want to, um, we might give them just a minute and then go ahead and get started. We are going, because we're running about an hour behind at this point, we're going to move up our break that was scheduled for 1045. Um, we'll make sure that we get that in before we start on item seven, just so everyone knows. You want to go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, lady gen ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Watson. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to be here today. I'm Shane Carter, the Director of Teacher Licensure. Uh, and as you went through the draft yesterday of uh, Dr. Watson's kind of board goals that he covered with you, there were two items uh, that were listed on there. One of those was the Kansas the, the Registered Teacher Apprenticeship Program, which will be the first topic I'm going to speak to you about. And then the second one, uh, the substitute licenses. So. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. And before I actually get into the actual uh, registered teacher apprenticeship programs application, I would like to take a moment to introduce a couple of individuals. Uh, first, with the Department of Commerce, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Shonda Anderson Atwater. She is the director of the Office of Apprenticeships. And as we've gone through this process of determining how and if we wanted to participate in a teacher apprenticeship, uh, the support that Shonda has provided us, uh, the teacher licensure team, and then uh, other partners such as KBOR throughout this process has been phenomenal. Uh, she's, it's a great partnership. And I can't understate the fact that as we move this program forward, it will require a partnership with the Department of Commerce as we uh, look and, and, and determine if we uh, implement this program. So with that said, uh, there has been a couple of things that have uh, changed since uh, we last met. So House Bill 2292 was actually approved, and now the Kansas Apprenticeship Act is uh, in place. So that changes a little bit of our, our, our planning uh, and our application that we were, were, were planning on doing previously. But the work for the apprenticeship, as Ms. Ma uh, spoke yesterday about some of the work that the board's done or uh, licensure's done, we've, we've worked it and then legislator, legislators come in and you know they support us even though we started the work. So that's a short, no that's not a short way, that's a long way to say we started this work about 10 months ago. Uh, kind of between the Office of Apprenticeships and teacher licensure and started working with our higher ed partners to determine if this was an actual program that we thought that we should uh, get in place regardless if uh, the, the act was in place or not. And we did. So the benefit to this program is it is a true grow your own program where a community, a local school can identify those community members that they can get enrolled in a program, get them trained, and that person stays uh, in that area and uh, becomes a teacher. So other programs that we have on, uh, or active programs that we have, this one's different in the fact that these individuals will not be the teacher of record. So when we keep that in mind, as we talk about the registered teacher apprenticeship program, you may hear the term apprenticeship uh, through other programs. The, it's not the same. This is uh, individuals that are not teacher of record uh, that are going to complete the program. So the briefing that I'm going to give you today is to go through the actual application. It's kind of the first start uh, of the process in order to get our program registered. Uh, if uh, the application is approved, the next step is it would move to the Office of Apprenticeships to be su submitted to the Governor's Council for, for approval and then actually become a uh, registered apprenticeship. Uh, so originally when I was setting up to do this briefing, it, we weren't going to go through uh, House Bill 2292, but it was approved. So I thought we'd better you know, discuss a little bit of it. But if you're looking at that Apprenticeship Act, Section 6 deals with uh, the actual, what they reference as the Educator Registered Apprenticeship Grant. Uh, so when the term educator is used, we're calling our program a Registered Teacher Apprenticeship Program. This is very important because this is set up solely to train teachers. When we use the term educator, that indicates could be principals, superintendent, or superintendents, school specialists, whatever the case, but this program is only for teachers. But as part of that act, it, it, told, it basically uh, requires us to partner with the Secretary of Commerce and de de determine the, the rules and regulations of the actual program. So other parts about the grant. So as far as money, 
Uh, there is money that's attached to it. They set aside $3 million every year that we could use to pay for tuition. Uh, as far as that tuition, it's capped out at $2,750 per individual, and it's available for four years for a person. Uh, that money would be paid directly to that individual through the Department of Commerce, not through uh, the school district nor the Department of Education. So it requires us to go ahead and set up uh, partnerships with at least one university or college. Uh, we've been doing that work, and uh, it also requires that that individual to, or that university to deliver training in a manner that allows for one to uh, work full time and then complete their college training as well. Uh, and that's the prioritization. And then we're also tasked to award that grant equitably across the state. So this isn't just a uh, opportunity for one school district. It should be available for rural school districts, um, urban school districts, but it has potential for, once again, to allow them to identify those individuals in their community that they would like to get into a teacher preparation program and then uh, retain them. Now, one thing to keep in mind, this is not a short-term answer or a short-term fix. It is an investment of that district to keep uh, that individual in this program and complete, uh, complete the teacher preparation program and stay in the district. So uh, people ask, is this the answer to, uh, to teacher vacancy? It's not the silver bullet, but it will help. It's another, um, another option that we have that allows districts to, to grow their own. So as far as the actual application, you should have had the application uploaded into your uh, board packets uh, th that's in there. So the minim minimum qualifications are set by 29 Code of Fe Federal Regulations. And so as we talk about the rules and regulations that, that we have to establish, a lot of those rules are established by CFR uh, 29 and 29.5. So as you go through it, it kind of breaks down uh, the different parts or federal requirements that we have to have to set up the program. But we do get to set the, uh, set the minimum qualifications. So for that apprentice, uh, we set it as a, at age 18. This could be an individual that has a high school diploma, a GED, or it could be an individual that actually has completed some college. Uh, during our last meeting, I, I spoke about how the program's flexible or scalable depending on prior experience and that prior education. So people can enter the program at any point, as long as they haven't completed a bachelor's degree. Uh, as far as our approach, there's different options. Uh, we kind of touched on this last time. It could be a time-based or a competency-based. Ours is a competency-based, uh, and it's set up for four years. And our competencies that are in there are based on the Kansas Educator Evaluation Protocol, or the KEEP rubric. Uh, so that's the on-the-job learning piece that that educator or that individual will do as they're completing their related technical instruction through that university. And additional pieces, as I spoke about, Individuals can get uh, credit for on-the-job learning and uh, previous college credit. So as far as our probationary period, it's set at one year. The requirements for a probationary period is uh, typically the quarter of the actual program. The program is four years and not to exceed a year. Uh, so uh, one year is what our program is. The difficult part, uh, the apprentice wage schedule, believe it or not, pairs across the state. They're paid differently depending on where you live. And it was tough to find a, a number uh, that you know, would work across the state because based on requirements of Department of Commerce, it has to be a livable wage in order for this to get approved uh, through their office. So we had, uh, after doing a review, the, the uh, salaries were anywhere from uh, right under $11 an hour to about $17, $18 an hour. And these apprentices should fill or occupy a space that's slightly above uh, a para, but lower than a an actual licensed teacher. So 14 is what we uh, came up with. Another component of the apprenticeship is the wage increase as an individual progresses through the program. So we did implement a 2% wage increase, which is roughly about 25 cents uh, per increase. Um, other uh, components of the actual program, we do have to abide by uh, the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations. So there are uh, equal opportunity, affirmative actions, and complaint procedures that are nested in this actual application. Those were set up and assisted with the Department of Commerce as they uh, provided us, you know, kind of how we have to handle those uh, complaints if they were to arise. And um, as KSD serving as the intermediary, first the district has to try to uh, solve the problem. If there's still a complaint, they would send it to KSD and then we would partner with Department of Commerce to get resolution to that particular issue. Also, a reciprocity of the apprenticeship program is established. 
because uh, let's face it, sometimes individuals may have enrolled in the program, life happens, they have to move. So if an individual started a program in, let's say, Garden City, and then they needed to move to Salina, if Salina had a program, then they could move in and start pick up their program and uh, continue to work towards that apprenticeship. So there are procedures that are in there, and it also applies to out-of-state as well. So based on, you know, kind of the, the brief last time, it was our recommendation that, um, that the application that we provided that you get it approved and then get submitted over to Department of Commerce to, to go through the process to be approved by the Council of Apprenticeship. Shane, uh, I know you mentioned this right at the beginning, but again, to state for the board, so this is the recommendation, this is going to be the recommendation, but in between last month and this month, yep. Kansas legislature passed a law. Yeah. So what effect, again for the board, what effect does the law have or change what you may have presented yep. or, or doesn't? Yeah, so uh, the, the major change is one, we'd already established a partnership with uh, Department of Commerce, so I made it required. Next, there are timelines that are associated with uh, how we have to implement this program. So one of our first hard dates is one, one March of 2024. That's when we have to have the rules and regulations established for this program. Uh, next is one January of 2025. We have, or yeah, one January of 2025, we have to have um, basically data collected uh, about uh, how the program, the pilot's working. And then by uh, the following year, 2026, we provide an update to, to legislators about the success of the program. And then as far as money, it did also set aside uh, $3 million, which will be available on 1 July of 2023. So as we started talking about you know, the pilot program and the emphasis of moving forward and getting this started, that kind of helped us get moving a little faster as far as getting this uh, program set up and, and, and moving. Thank you. Betty? Okay, just um, a little bit of clarification because on my recommended motion, it is uh, that we start a pilot program grant, which is a little different from what that's stating. Can you? Yeah, so in order for us to start the pilot program, we have to have our application submitted. So this is the first step to start that program. Okay, so that would be the recommended motion on the screen? The motion that we have um, approved the application to start a grant. teaching registered apprenticeship pilot program grant. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Well, we, we can take the grant off. Take the grant off? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so if that's the case, then I'm ready, Madam Chair, to make a motion. Yes, ma'am. I move that the Kansas State Board of Education approve the application to start a teaching registered apprenticeship program. And a second from Dina. Any further discussion or questions? In that case, we're ready to vote. All in, is there a question down there? HB 2292, we're, we're compelled we're yes. to get this going. Because yes, we have until correct. March to have something correct in place. Yes, for our rules and regulations, yes. So really, HB 2292 is a driver to <laughs> Yes. Okay. But even without it, this was uh, something right. we were working on, and it was a, we, we feel it was going to be a successful program. Gotcha. Michelle. So thank you, Madam Chair. So just a quick question. So you're doing the pilot, um, and, and it how, uh, you have to review if it's successful or not successful. Part of this is, did you say part of this is federal money, part of this is our federal yes. grant money? So as far as like the overall expense or how mm -hmm. how well it's working in the districts, who decides to pick it up or who decides to work with us? They don't have to do this, correct? Yeah. No, it's, it's not mandatory that anyone does it. It's an option. So the district does play a part in this. They're going to be the wage provider or the sponsor. So they, you know, that $14 an hour, the, the, they would be committed to, to that individual and pay that salary. As far as other grants and opportunities to fund the program, uh, we're, there are scholarships that are available we're going to try to tap into. There's other grants. Um, uh, Department of Commerce has submitted what's uh, called the Metal Art Grant, which uh, the Office of Apprenticeship set aside $3 million out of that grant if it's approved for this program to help pay for expenses. Uh, we also are working on two other grants uh, to get additional funds into this program. 
when you said something about um, it applies out of state, if, if they just decide to move or they move to a state that 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 they're not doing that in that state, what? So they're, they've just let the program. Do they owe the money back or the grant the grant money back or how does that how does that work and is that up front to that to that student? Yeah, so that's one of the, the actual finer details that we have to work out with Department of Commerce because um, other states that have implemented this program, it can be done in a, a various different ways. Some of them choose to it would come through um, you know their Department of Education. They would have the districts do memor memorandums of understanding that if someone left that you know they owed money back in return. Mm -hmm. Um, other states, they, they looked at it as a you know, statewide strategy and they didn't want to set up a memorandum of, of agreement or anything. As long as they were getting the teacher prepared, they felt it benefited the profession, even if they left out of state. So um, as far as that, that fine particular piece of the, the paying back, that's, we have to work that out with Department of Commerce. So the goal would be, to, I mean, they'll have to keep, you'll have to keep finding grants and money to keep this going. Yep. Um, in, within the state of Kansas, or report back to to see if they'll fund if, if the if the legislature will fund it or yes. I mean, so that's one of the goals of the program or for the pilot. From from my perspective, is we need to identify. So we're very restricted on the money that we can use and how it can be used. If there's adjustments that could be made uh, to help pay for some other expense, it would be more beneficial and make this program more sustainable. So after we go through this pilot, you know, that's that's something that I think will come out as we finish it up and then make those recommendations. Instead of trying to apply for all these grants, right? Could it be something that the local district decides it's to to do on their own? They, like a community could pick up that money and decide to not they not can't. follow all those federal grant and federal strings that come attached to that and do it their own way. Right. So there's yes. So a district can commit whatever they want to that. How uh, there's also our local workforce boards that are through the Department of Commerce that are set up where there's money that's available for individuals to use as long as there is a registered apprenticeship program that is set up. So, so the short answer to your question is yes. There can be other uh, money that's identified in that local community. Okay, thank you. Got another question from Ann. Uh, thank you, Shane, for all your work on this. I know we've been with the governor's uh, council, been talking about how do we get this apprenticeship thing going, so I'm really glad you guys were all working behind the scenes on it, but this is not like new stuff. We've had apprenticeship programs for decades in the Commerce Department. Yeah. I'm just thrilled that finally we got education added to the list. They've been funding this for decades. It's not like apprenticeships are going to go away, and I think if we can make this successful, then it'll just be another one of the real good tools in our toolkit to, to get more people involved. But, I mean, I had the feeling, and I hope you do too, that our, the, the, part, the uh, Commerce Department partners were really excited about this addition. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, as John is here, every event, she's, yes, they're very excited. And, you, you know, you hit on something that I should have brought this up when we were, uh, when I was giving you the overview. So apprenticeship training's been around since we've been a nation, and um, as far as when you think of apprenticeship, I always go like to thinking of electricians that are out there. It's used a lot in uh, private industry and uh, some other areas, and if you look at the Registered Apprenticeship Act, um, House Bill 2292, you're gonna see there's a lot that's mentioned about other areas, other professions. Uh, what is unique is the fact that Department of Labor officially recognized uh, teaching as an area that could qualify for a registered apprenticeship, and that is a very recent phenomenon that happened on or around 1 January of 2022. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a motion and a second, so I don't see any additional questions. Board members, ready to vote? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Motion passes. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're gonna, do you want to move on into the next briefing? Go right ahead, yep. All right. And I do apologize, I'm about two pots of coffee low today. <laughs> and I can't read. Eric, Eric will mark it for you. I'm going to have to pull out my glasses. <laughs> All right, so as far as topics go that are on the board agenda today, I was much more eager to bring the first one to you than the second one. Um, you know, over the, the past couple of years, uh, we have had an issue with uh, substitute licenses and, and uh, a vacancy of substitutes across the state. So it's a very difficult um, 
problem, an issue that we're having. There's not a perfect solution. Um, you know, so it's, it's a good conversation we need to have, but I wish there was a, you know, a great solution that we could easily find and tap into, but that's not the case. So as I was putting this together, um, I did fail to uh, think of our, our new board members uh, that, that didn't have that historical context of, of the actual substitute uh, issues that we've worked through. So as I go through these particular items, I'll give you background and history on kind of what's happened. So first we'll start with uh, wave the number of days. So this is in effect and it's set to expire on June 30th of 2023, but the number of days that an individual could serve on a substitute license was waived uh, for the last three school years. So starting in 2021, uh, 21, 22, and 22, 23. So as far as that was uh, an, uh, an emer emergency declaration um, that was put into effect, um, if uh, this isn't continued, uh, it's not the end of the world. We would go back to our pre-COVID process of um, submitting waivers to extend the number of days if a district needed to use um, a substitute uh, outside those uh, day requirements. Now, as far as what allows us to do that, it's uh, KISA regulations. Um, that are set up that address waiver submission and then the requirements, the, the, the limitation to the number of days of uh, individuals on a substitute. And those regs are 91-31-42 is specific to waivers and 91-31-34 uh, breaks down the requirements of a substitute license. So in a future slide, we'll get into uh, sub the different substitute licenses and then I'll cover those day limitations for you uh, as we get into that. Also during this time, uh, starting uh, at the January um, 2022 board meeting, uh, based on uh, the, the shortage we were having, uh, the TEAL license, uh, the Temporary Emergency Authorized License was uh, created. And this basically allowed for an individual who, or allowed a district to hire an individual uh, that they had some type of relationship with uh, that had a, a high school diploma and basically allowed them to serve as a substitute teacher. This lasted from for about a semester, so from January 2013 through uh, June 1st of uh, 2022. About that, around that time, we came back, and um, this is still an issue. The substitute license vacancies were still an issue, so at that point, we implemented what was called the expanded modified emergency substitute uh, license on a temporary basis. So this basically was birthed out of the teal. And the changes were there was a set of modules that were created uh, with our partners at uh, Greenbush to help train substitute teachers uh, with specific topics uh, before they entered into the classroom. So the individual would complete the, ca complete the training, get a verification of hire from a district, um, then apply for a license, subject to you know, our background checks and everything else. But the main premise, the main change was that this training modules, these training modules were created. So on about that same time after the, uh, that uh, was implemented and it had an expiration date of December of 2022. Uh, at that time, the, the board also tasked uh, teacher licensure and coordination with the teacher vacancy supply committee and the professional standards board uh, to set up a, a group to look into long-term solutions for substitute teaching. Uh, and that's where these pending regulation updates come from. So that working group was established in July and provided updates to the board in October. And part of those recommendations were um, you know, changing the term of the emergency substitute license, creating a legacy license uh, for retired educators, which allows an individual who served retired in Kansas, they can apply for a legacy license, which has a term of 20 years. Um, that way it uh, allows them to continue to serve in a substitute capacity without uh, completing additional professional development requirements or submitting multiple applications and fees uh, to qualify for those licenses. And it also established that we would create a substitute handbook and guidelines. And all these, um, Current regulation updates are working uh, between myself and the Rex committee uh, with a goal of getting those to you uh, no later than one October. So uh, before we get into the, you know, the main topic of discussion today is that uh, temporary extended modified uh, substitute license. So I wanted to provide you a little data and a little background on it. So one, our substitute licenses, we currently have right under 12,000. Uh, and here there's a breakout of uh, different substitute license holders. So what's not mentioned here is individuals that hold a, you know, a standard teaching license can also serve uh, as, a, as a substitute. They're limited to 140 days uh, based on 91-31-34. Um, um, 
our standard substitute license holders, what distinguishes them from emergency substitute is the fact they've completed a teacher preparation program. So in some cases, it could be an individual that held a professional license, it expired, and they didn't meet a renewal requirement, or they retired and they wanted to continue to sub. Uh, they could qualify for this. It's a five-year license, and uh, it would allow an individual to teach uh, 90 days in a substitute position. Then we break on down to the emergency substitutes. So currently in regulation, there's two different options. And um, as far as the, the requirements for those particular licenses, if you're in 91-1-200, uh, it defines those licenses. 91-1-203 uh, uh, has the requirements for those licenses. But if you have a bachelor's degree or higher, then, um, then an individual can serve in a uh, substitute position 45 days, and there's not a limitation to the number of days that they can serve uh, in a school district. That's distinguished from an individual that has 60 college credit hours, but less than a bachelor's degree. They're limited to uh, 30 days in the same assignment and also capped out at 75 days per semester. So uh, a little more limiting. Our expanded emergency substitute license, uh, it has the same limitations as that 60 college credit hour currently. Uh, but once again, that's set to expire. And when we do a breakdown of the numbers, um, you know, our expanded emergency substitute licenses, it's a pretty small number, 374. Um, when we introduced the TEAL, our numbers were around 930 or so people applied and received that license. So a couple things to that. Uh, the, the short nature of the license, as we implemented it, uh, it, it had you know basically like four months uh, was the expiration date, so that's kind of a detractor from individuals wanting to apply for the license, and also the uncertainty about the license, because basically every semester we've come come back to either you know approve the extension or terminate the program. So that uncertainty, I think, has impacted the numbers that uh, of individuals that applied for the license. So let's break into what exactly is the exp expanded modified emergency substitute license. So I touched on it earlier, requirements, that high school diploma, completion of Greenbush plus substitute training modules. Uh, as you look at these modules, the, the modules highlighted uh, and bolded and asterisk, those are new um, modules that Greenbush has completed. They're not actually part of our set that individuals used over the last year. Uh, so that is a, a new additional training that, it's, that, that, that has been completed by Greenbush that they can implement into this program. It also required that background check and application fee. And like I said, it's going to have the same limitation uh, to the number of days. And I did misspeak. It's 25 days in the same assignment and 75 days during a semester. Uh, a little further uh, information about that expanded modified data. Um, the average age was around 37. The age range was from anywhere from 18 to 77. Uh, the breakout for our emergency substitute holders, their age range was 18 to 89. So the age ranges are, are basically the same. The average number used by district, it was one or two, but we did have some locations that used uh, more of these licenses. So when you see you know, Topeka or Wichita, that's not just the Topeka or Wichita school district, it's more of that greater community. It could be a private school that used them or uh, a neighboring school. Um, as far as uh, positions that were served, so there's two surveys that were submitted, one through teacher licensure, another through Greenbush. Uh, through the teacher licensure uh, survey that we submitted, we did ask you know, what type of positions were these individuals serving. Uh, and an individual could serve in multiple positions because it is set up for an intermittent substitute. They're rotating through different classrooms. So of all the respondents that use this actual, they use the license, about 79% served in some type of elementary capacity throughout the year, 58% the middle level, 66 the secondary, and then 30% uh, special education. So the main takeaway is individuals were using uh, these individuals in multiple um, teaching assignments. Yep. Catherine. Who, thank you. Who completed the surveys? The yeah. superintendent themselves, like. Yeah, it was sent out to um, our curriculum list, list serve, so it would be, it would be building leaders, okay. superintendents, so it could be principals, okay. superintendents, or other staff members that are in those leadership positions. Uh, so of our two surveys, um, one sampled about 87 folks. Uh, the other, uh, we had uh, like 180 respondents. 
Uh, but of those surveys, uh, the overwhelming majority was in support of continuing this actual license. And uh, we also, through teacher licensure, asked about if that uh, the Springbush training, if districts felt it was appropriate or, or helped, it was sufficient training for those individuals when they stepped into the classroom. And 94% stated yes. Now, for this discussion, you know, there are a couple different courses of action. You know, number one, we can cease uh, the expanded modified emergency substitute license, uh, which is set to happen on June 30th of 2023. Now, if it does end or terminates, there's not really another viable immediate option that can provide relief to districts. And then when we've had these conversations, I've had conversations with working group members, with the professional standards board, there's not an actual viable option outside of uh, this particular license. So that kind of leaves us with uh, the other two options, the expended, uh, extended, extend the expanded modified emergency substitute license. Uh, and if you were in favor of this, you know, we would look to expand it so we could actually do some more data collection and then also get out of the six month, every six months renewing this license. So if we could have a period of two years to collect data and uh, continue to track that, I think that would be very beneficial. And then the third course of action is that uh, it becomes permanent uh, and put into regulation. So as we're doing this regulation update, there would be an option to uh, update our regulations and bring that back to you for approval. Ready for some questions? I, absolutely. Okay. Um, what does that timeline look like for bringing it back for approval? Well, it would be next month. Okay. Uh, if, making sure. If you're ready. In, in order to get, if you're going yep. to, and then plus, if we're going to try to implement this, if, if you're going to do two or three, yeah. you have to do that in order to start the year. So it, June would be your deciding month in order to have. If you do one, we could bring it back at any time because it expires right now on June. So it, you wouldn't have to do anything. But your discussion today will tell us whether to bring it back or not for you. We're going to start with Ann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, th we had a quite robust discussion about this in the Professional Standards Board because I think we would have done this last fall probably, except that there was some disagreement on the Standards Board about whether or not we ought to have this. And I'd say they had two probably main concerns. One, a couple, I, not big concerns, only one or two people brought up they weren't excited about having 18-year-olds in the classroom. But the fact is um, an 18-year-old can come out of high school with 60 credit hours right now and be qualified to sub. And we have 18-year-olds as pairs all over the place. So that didn't bother me so much. And the other was, um, well, um, the training they thought was good. I think the 20 hours with more robust you know, testing, which is something we really wanted but they wanted the Professional Standards Board to take another run at it, so they were saying, well, why don't you make it temporary for two or three years and let us take another run at what subs ought to do? And I said, well, that's fine, but you can't be the party you know. You know, we've got to do something to expand the pool of substitutes. And what we learned from Teal was that there are a lot of really great subs out there who don't have 60 hours. PTO moms, retired business people, retired military, um, all kinds of folks. And the interesting um, discussion on the board, the Professional Standards Board, I think really was, is that board is a mix of administrators and teachers. And um, the administrators there, particularly superintendents, said, hey, if you guys don't do something on the state board by the 1st of July, I am going to be out in the cold. We are going to have classrooms that are not covered at all. And uh, so, um, I'm one of those people who thinks there's nothing magic about having 60 hours of college that makes you a great sub. I think there are life experiences that, that beat that all to heck. And um, I think the, the superintendents and the hirers out there are smart enough to figure out if we have an opportunity to let them, they will choose good people to be subs. So I highly encourage the board to bring this back next month and take some action so we don't hamstring our schools in the fall and leave kids without anybody in, in front of the classroom. So I'd be glad to answer any questions about what the Standards Board discussed as well. And thank you, Shane, for all your work on this. And Ann, you sit on that board. 
Kathy, aren't you on that board as well? You're, so Anne and Kathy both serve on that board. Um, let's go to Kathy. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, definitely had conversations with some, specifically the Dodge City, Garden City. Those are your big numbers. Now, what I was told in that was that 80% of those teal sub-licenses are actually working toward now to get their actual teaching degree and license. So to me, that's a huge factor when we're looking at what we're gonna be doing here because apparently that has driven people into the profession. They've discovered they like it. So I think that's a factor we definitely have to look at as well. Um, I wonder if, especially if we go into making this permanent, is there another avenue for training? Can other, like Fort Hayes, have opportunity to present training for this particular license as well? Go ahead. Okay, Madam Chair, may I? <laughs> yep. Okay, so just a couple of comments. So, so one, you know, talking about, uh, you know, this feeds right into the apprenticeship conversation. Uh, maybe you, uh, district, was able to identify an individual through this program uh, that doesn't meet education requirements. Uh, based on their performance, they're able to enroll them in the program and then um, get them qualified to be a teacher. So yes, it is a, a good recruitment tool. And some of the survey responses, there was a few where they did mention and highlight that, hey, we, we started these individuals on that program and they did enter programs. Uh, the next question, I was talking and I just forgot what you brought up on the other side. Oh, additional training. So right now there's other states that offer a very similar program. Uh, Missouri, uh, North Dakota, in Montana, all use a service called Frontline uh, that has training modules that are set up. The difference between Greenbush and Frontline is there's a, a charge for their right. uh, their service, and uh, Greenbush is providing their training for free. And but if you break down the actual training components of both entities, they're they're very similar, uh, close. But could there be additional training? They said absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jim Porter. Thank you, I, uh, to, a couple of things. First of all, I've always been, <coughs> con <coughs> pardon me, concerned with the TL license because of the word temporary, and we tend to, tend to keep kicking it down the road. So I certainly don't want to just extend that without some without a modification. I've been an adjunct teach college professor, uh, professor is an inaccurate term, uh, teacher, uh, and at, at a major university in Missouri and at a community college here in Kansas where I taught the beginning courses. This is to address the 18-year-old issue. I've had a lot of 18-year-olds in that class, most of whom I would not have under any circumstances put in a classroom when they finished the course, but two of them I would have. Uh, and, and I would have because I knew them and I had confidence in them and the to uh, to communicate to uh, and and both of them have become award-winning teachers later on. But I would have put them in a kindergarten or first or second grade classroom the next day if I had had that opportunity. And I had no question because one of them had been an aide and a, a student aide in a kindergarten classroom for a while. So I'm not as concerned about the 18-year-old. Uh, because I believe that the people that are making the decisions about who to put in the classroom is going to recognize that just just like I did. I'm going to support the extending. Uh, is there, because I've always believed that 60 hours was arbitrary, and I didn't see how that, uh, how that, uh, you know, guaranteed anything. So I don't see lowering standards. I said this before. I don't see changing the 60 hours as lowering the standards when the st standard to me didn't make sense to start with. Uh, so I'm going to support the extended. I was wondering about the two years. Uh, is that enough time? Uh, I, I would also support a longer time there, if, but, but I'll probably. Uh, and, uh, and, but I think it's important. But when I go to superintendent's meetings, and I do it regularly, and I always ask the question, how many of you have a substitute teacher that you are that that has done a good job in your school system that would not have been available prior and every hand in the room goes up every time 
Uh, so I think it's important for us to do something uh, but recognize, and I, of course, I'd like to even look at, at, at different criteria, but, uh, but I, and I've said that before, but so I'll get off that soapbox. Uh, but I think that we need to do something to address it, and I certainly think it's reasonable to look back instead of making it permanent to start with. Uh, Madam Chair, may I? Yes. So if, if the extended or extend the expanded uh, modified emergency substitute license is the route the board chooses. We did have volunteers from the professional standards board that were uh, eager to take this up. So they would be involved in that process for two years of kind of uh, assisting with evaluating and determining if we need to make changes to our training. So if that was approved, we would take that back to the professional standards board. Um, and the reason for the two years is it puts it more aligned with our current emergency substitute license, which has a two-year term. So from a communication piece, it makes it a little easier. Plus, there's uh, a lot of additional data we can gather over that two-year period versus, you know, six months or a year. So. Dennis. Well, I just want to kind of echo what Jim said. i hearing the same thing from superintendents. And I guess my question to you, you know, if... I, I like the extended uh, two-year thing. It gives you time, I think. I think I'm hearing that from yep. you, that gives yes. you some time. And um, the other thing is, uh, you know, peer review seems to be, a, a, at a local level, seems to be a really good safeguard. And, and I, you know, how that works out uh, over um, this two-year period, I mean, that, that's what I would uh, recommend is that we give that time to, for all this to come together and then we have time to look at it again when it comes around in two years. Yeah, so, yes, ma'am. Danny. Thank you. Um, can we make this an action item? Because to me, it seems like a, a no brainer. And it seems like, based on the information that I'm looking at, that it's been a positive thing for the school district. And each school district is making the decision on the person they're hiring so thank you can we make it a you have to suspend the rules uh, uh, your policy that says one month you'll receive the information and the next month you will vote so that would be two separate votes on that Danny and we've done that before so 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 you make a motion to suspend the rules I'm going to try that next time I get stopped by the police. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first Sorry, motion. I couldn't read <laughs> Mark. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be. Mark. So, uh, the, so the, first motion, motion the first motion requires a super majority, so you need seven to approve the first motion. Uh, to amend and then you can take that up uh, for an action item in the, in the same month that an informational item is, is presented. Okay. <coughs> so I'll make a motion to suspend the rules. Ka Kathy's got a question. Let's get Kathy in okay. and then I can call on you again if there's nobody else. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the midst of digging into this, one of the things that I um, understand is that high school diploma does not equal GED. That, that okay. is correct. So in talking to some folks at Fort Hayes, as well as just personal experience and people, I have an issue with that. Um, colleges accept GEDs as a high school diploma to enter college. So to say for a temporary, I mean, to me, it's kind of like on the level of some of this other stuff, like why are we differentiating when a GED is an equivalency diploma and college is accepted as such, why would, and your average age was 37. I mean, you've got somebody with some life experience. I'm like, so that's my question on that level. Why are we creating that division? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a messaging uh, perspective. You know, we value education sure. here and that diploma going through, you know, private or public school and earning that diploma. We try to promote that and that's, pretty much why we made the decision because we value that diploma and, and i understand that but we're also saying 60 years 60 hours of college aren't a big deal you know so to me yeah. we're kind of saying one thing and another at the same time um so we'd like to look at that 
but also when we're expanding this, are we saying they they're licensed only in that district? We're keeping that requirement, correct? Or well, I, we can. Okay, if, so if I just want to make sure if we're that, going yeah. to go anywhere, especially now. Like, if we're expanding this for another two years, are we keeping that rule of they're hired by the district? They're only substituting for that district. So yeah, that's my no. question. And, and I'll be honest, that's for, so feedback from, from districts and individuals, that is a difficult aspect of it based on the paperwork and requirements that they have to submit to our office. So that is a, you know, a bit of a challenge, but that is one of the requirements of that license at, at this time, so. Ma'am, but I was thinking the way this is written up now, they, they would apply to us for the license and they could go anywhere. They wouldn't have to have a job secured first right. so this is up to you yeah, yeah i mean you can do but whatever you what want what shane's but. bringing you is the current criteria right. which is only in that school district with an expansion of the modules or training you want to go in a different direction you're certainly welcome to go in a different direction but the the current expires and what he's saying is do you want to continue that well, it's not a straight continuation. I mean, we have increased training, and it's not an ex it's not an extension of Teal. It has increased training and testing requirements. I'm but always cautious when we change titles of something and tweak it a little bit, and, yeah. and say it's different. It is. It's substantially the same. Yeah. It's been. It is changed a little bit. There's additional training. Right. But the current expires, so what you want to put in place, mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want. But that's what it would be if it is being proposed. And I think the GED thing is a good question, but I think that would be something that will let the Professional Standards Board chew on as they, you know, do something over these next two years. And for right now, we could live with, with high school diploma. But we want to be clear. So you're saying that what you have on the board here says the, they only work in one district? Yeah. So okay. So that was part of the original. Just need to be clear. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and to further clarify, they are only allowed to work in one district. May they apply to another? They, they could. Okay. Which made it a little, a little more difficult because they were forced to submit an application for each, uh, each entity that they wanted to work for. I, I'm just going to remind everyone why that's in there, whether you like it or not. It's because a superintendent had to say, I agree, I know this person, I'm going to hire that person. So when this originally came in, it was, you can apply to more than one district, but the other superintendent, he or she would have to sign off. And the way we do a general teacher license or a general sub, when you issue that, that's good for the state of Kansas. So again, you could change that. But that's, that's why it was there, to kind of get a protection versus this, I could go anywhere. And I just want to comment that in my district, I, I live in Overland Park, Shawnee Mission, the districts around me are large um, and condensed. And I've asked superintendents near me, are you using this? And they've said no. And yet, the emails that I continue to get are from those smaller districts, and they are adamant. We absolutely need to have this because we love the teachers that we brought in on Teal, and it's really important to us to keep them. So this is something that I can support. We've got a couple more again. Dennis? Yeah. Well, I, I just want to weigh in. What, what you just said is really important. I mean, that's you know, we're talking about local control, and I, I can see how this could work. That's the best you know, pathway for this to work. And then, and then when it comes to GED, you know, the, you know that word equivalence, that's... That's really what this is all about, what a GED is all about. And Ann, you made a point you know, uh, earlier about uh, 60 hours of college credit is really moot when you have, when you have life experience. So someone taking a GED at 35, you know, uh, hey, that's probably as good as, a, 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 as 60 hours in college. So I, I think these are just points we need to look at you know, and, and, and put in the mix that hey, you know, we've got good people and and they would make good teachers. Let's, let's make the pathway as good and easy for them or, you know, for the local district to work with. Okay. Jim Porter. And I'll be brief. Is there a way that a person can apply for the second district without having to go through the whole application process, without having to pay again and all that sort of stuff? 
Yeah, so we, we could waive the fee for that, but we would need the application, though, in order to track it and have that verification signed off by that, that superintendent. Okay, you gave me the right answer. If yep. you had given me the wrong answer, I was going to suggest that that also go to the professional right. standards right. board. As long as they pay the one fee, we can bring it in waived. I don't see any more questions, so I'll go to Danny. I agree with the GED thing. I think that's something really important, but I, I like having the local superintendents to be able to hire whoever they want to hire. I think it's important, so I'd like to move to suspend. get rid of the rules. Suspend. Oh, I'm suspend. sorry. Suspend. I mean, suspend, suspend the suspend rules. The rule. I have a second from Betty. So move. <laughs> To clarify, I have a second from Betty to suspend the rules. All right, all in favor, raise your hand. Dina, is your hand up? That appears to be unanimous. Motion passes. Now you have a motion. Now you would need a motion to, to make the receive item an action item and specify the terms. So and go no, ahead. Not you, but I'm I'd like to move that we extend the expanded modified emergency substitute license temporarily for two years, continue collecting data. A second that. Second. From Ann and a second from Danny. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You, you got a bonus money. You didn't see that coming, did you, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 
come back. <laughs> Make sure that we have our next presenter ready. Um, item number seven, receive staff response and act on proposed emergency safety intervention ESI regulation amendments. Welcome back, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it is my pleasure to talk some more about the emergency safety intervention regulations and give you a somewhat brief response to the comments that you've read and the comments that were made yesterday. Um, here's where all this stems from. 2017, we have an opinion that came out of a hearing officer that was an employee of the Department of Education. Within that opinion, there were a few sentences that were included that raised some eyebrows. The first one is that a classroom cannot possibly be a place of seclusion. Don't know that I would have made that particular opinion, but that was something that was included within the opinion and may have been a basis for that decision. Part of the problem was there was no definition specifically of an enclosed area. So in one of the allegations of seclusion, the hearing officer found it could not possibly be seclusion because it's a classroom. Okay. The other findings from that particular uh, review were that evacuation of classmates did not constitute seclusion because the student had not been placed in the room. The student was already there. Some disagreement about whether or not that counts as seclusion or not. And then finally, it was not seclusion if there are others within the same room. I will tell you that if you look up the dictionary definition of seclusion, there apparently there's a, there's a difference of opinion as to what it means to be secluded. But the hearing officer at that time found that because there were other people, paras and teachers in the room with the student at the time, it was not seclusion. As a result, that's why we're here. Those things being addressed are the only things, in all honesty, that are really changed as a result of these proposed regulations. The language is a little bit wonky. The language is not the easiest to understand. But I would submit to you, this is what I've expressed to you for some time. The language in a regulation is written for people that have to nitpick the regulations. They are not generally written for those that actually have to use them. The problem that we have and the problem why the language has been modified to the form that it, that's been before you is trying to come up with a phrase to represent a room that may or may not actually be a room. And if there's a door, it may, or may or may not have a door. And it doesn't count if it's a room if there's other people in the room. Go. Give me, give me that phrase, and I would love to replace it with whatever we have. That is why we came up with this area of, I, area of purposeful isolation. Okay. So is that a phrase that anyone else uses? No. Is it something that we can provide training and professional development on? I think so. That's the goal. I have summarized um, the major concerns that were brought out yesterday. I am paraphrasing these. There are those in the room that may say, well, you may have ignored my concern or misunderstood it. But I have read through all of the materials. And the first area of concern is that students need to be able to access private spaces to de-escalate. Students often use these private spaces, these areas of seclusion on their own. And sometimes teachers will escort students to these separate spaces specifically so they could calm down. OK. Do that. Students can do that all day long. Students taking advantage of the private spaces or the areas of seclusion have not been placed there by school personnel. The language that we've put in the regulation is very intentional. Uh, a law professor used to drill on our heads all the time. Don't think great thoughts. Just read the law. The law says that the student has to be placed somewhere by school personnel. If a student goes on their own, or even if the student is encouraged to go to a quiet space or a whatever terminology that is appropriate, that's fine. That is the student going there on their own. Doesn't count as seclusion. It's the way that the regulation is written. Seclusion, again, requires that the student is prevented from leaving or has reason to believe that they are prevented from leaving that area. So if you have a student that chooses on their own, say, uh, you know, Dr. Watson, I need some, some time. I need to get away. I'm, I'm amped up or I'm, I'm anxious. Okay. okay, well then I suggest you go over in this area that we have for you. And you make the simple comment, come back when you feel it's more when you're comfortable. Come back when you're ready. Maybe you come back when the bell rings that would be clarifying for that student that you're not prevented from leaving that area 
and that you have no reason to believe that you are prevented from leaving that particular area. Now, if you do have a student go into a room, right, and you as a teacher decide, well, you know what, you're going to stay here. I'm either going to shut the door and you're going to stay in here, or I'm commanding that you do not leave this area until I come back and relieve you. There's a good argument there that that student has a reason to believe they've been prevented from leaving. At that point, yes, they've been secluded. That is true, by the way, even if you don't adopt any of these regulations. The regulation does provide that if you prevent a student from leaving a secluded area, seclusion. So that, that doesn't change. The second major concern that, that we heard or, or read was you cannot provide instruction while a student is, is de-escalating. Or that instruction is not always in the classroom setting. I forget the gentleman's last name or the name. One of the teachers came and said, instruction isn't always just teaching the subject matter. Absolutely right. This board has designated, for example, social emotional growth as something that you believe is important. I would, I would contend that that is an academic endeavor. That is providing instruction. Instruction doesn't just mean teaching two plus two equals four. Um, it means much more than that. Do we define instruction? Not in the regulation. Uh, that's somewhat intentional. And I don't know what it means to meaningfully engage with the student to provide instruction. That's another major concern that's been brought up. It's been shared with me. It's in writing. I would submit that all of the educators, they do know what it means to provide instruction. They just don't understand. They didn't realize they know what it means to provide instruction. So I reached out to my, you know, Mr. Google Box, and I just looked up the definition. What does it mean? What is instruction? And these are the three top definitions that came up. If you're providing directions or an order, or if you're providing detailed information telling some how something should be done, and the last part is probably the, the most relevant, teaching, providing education, that is providing instruction. If you are engaged with the students to assist them in de-escalation, you are instructing them on how to manage themselves and their behavior and, and what's going on. Okay. Now, is this specifically written in the regulation? No. Uh, again, if you want us to add a half-page definition of what all is included in instruction, we can, but as many of you pointed out, we really hate these regulations that go on and on and on and on and on because you don't like the legalese. I don't blame you. Um, if you do, if you have a common term, it doesn't specifically have to be defined in the regulation unless you are using it in a unique manner. That's why we don't define what the word instruction means. If, if, the, if you all feel that we need to define more what that means to engage, to provide instruction, well, okay, uh, we'll do that. But that is the intention, um, and that's the way it's been explained for the past year and a half that, that I've been working on a particular clause. So, and again, uh, I'm not trying to minimize by any means the concerns that anyone has brought forward. I fully acknowledge that the, the way that the regulations have been written is not the easiest thing to understand, which is why we came up with this review tool. Madam Chair, with your permission, um, if I could go through just a couple of scenarios very quickly through here to demonstrate how it is that these regulations, in my opinion, actually are very workable. Uh, I brought this large book up here, by the way, as a demonstrative. And the attorneys behind me are wondering, why are you bringing the big book in here? We, that, we don't like that. So the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, federal law, codified, been around for a few decades. If I print that off, it's 30 pages. This book represents the guidance that has been put out to explain those 30 pages. If you look on the KSDE website, there is a, a large amount of resources available explaining, providing professional development on what the ESI regulations mean. That will be updated and that will continue regardless of what the, this body decides on the regulations. So I use this as a demonstrative. The regulations always require additional materials to explain how to use them. Any attorney that tells you they understood FERPA and they knew exactly how it worked the first time they read it are liars. Calling you a liar. You're lying if you understood this the first time. If you understood it the second time, it's not true. The more exposure you have to it, the more professional development, the more it's going to make sense. Now, with this self-review tool. Uh, there we go. 
Now, again, this doesn't require great thoughts. You just read the questions one at a time. And the first scenario that I want to share with you, just imagine, and Madam Chair, if I may, you're going to be the teacher in this case, okay? You have a student that has run out of, has run down a hallway. You don't know why. The student is upset, clearly, for some reason. Runs down a hallway, goes into a resource room, which is what the school typically refers to this. There's a desk, maybe a bean bag. Um, there is a window in the door. Four walls, ceiling floor, has a door. The door locks from the inside if the child or whoever's in there wants to hold it to lock it. Student goes into that room. There's nobody else in the room with them. Student closes the door. Faculty are working with the student, trying to encourage the student, let us open the door. We have the key. We can open it. Um, but they don't want to hurt the particular student. They don't want to bash her with the door. So they're working with them. They're communicating with that student to try to get the door open. That's the scenario. So did the school personnel remove the student from a learning environment? No. Did school personnel separate the student from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment? No. Did school personnel place the student in a separate space other than an open hallway or similarly open environment? No. Probably not subject to seclusion. The child has placed themselves in timeout. They are using their own de-escalation de technique. Timeouts allowed. Another scenario. That's going to be edited. Shannon's not here anymore. Sorry. Another scenario. A teacher sends the student to the school counselor's office because the student is acting up in class and needs to calm down. The school counselor's office is down the hall next to the vice principal's office. Um, there is some communication conversation with the school counselor in there. The school counselor or the teacher says, you need to go down there and calm down and, and I'm sending you to the, the counselor's office too because that's just something that we do. Going through the same scenario. Did school personnel remove the student from the learning environment? Yes. Okay. Were school personnel meaningfully engaged with the student to provide instruction? Instruction, no. What's the school counselor doing? How Just do you asking define what's that? So these are some of the questions are how do you define timeout? How do you define instruction? That's why you have a book. Right. You're the teacher. You tell me. What's, yes. a school, what's the, the, the school counselor doing? The school counselor is providing, essentially, SEL instruction. Okay. Probably not subject to seclusion. I will we'll take any scenario you want. Anyone can go through these scenarios, and I've shared these. I've asked people, break this. Give me an example or give anybody a situation to where when you work through this tool, it doesn't match what you think the law requires you to do. This is the professional development that's going to be put out by the agency, assuming, and I'm making a huge assumption, um, th this is the type of professional development that I'm saying hopefully will clarify and make this easier for. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I can show you the, the seclusion or the ESI website if anyone wants to see that. I think I showed it to you last time I was here. Um, with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions or I'll defer to the body to discuss and vote. Thank you. Um, we do have some questions. I want to start with one from one of the letters, though, and I, I did actually play with the tool myself, checked the different buttons. Seems to work well. It's pretty straightforward, as you've demonstrated. Um, in one of the many letters that we received, I have an example, so I figured I'd, you might want to leave the tool up. Sure. Um, but the, the gray area that I think is, is common is the word may. I, I see a lot of letters where folks are saying this may be misinterpreted. We, we may interpret it the wrong way. And so, for example, when a student is asked to go to a special education room or area, such as the counselor's office, to de-escalate, it's best not to engage students in any teaching until they have finished the de-escalation process and can safely engage in expressing their emotions and are capable of processing. At these times, students are in a, quote, separate space and, quote, removed from the learning environment by staff. 
The staff are not meaningfully engaging with the student to provide instruction, says the letter, while the student calms down. Quite often they are also separated from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment as they are no longer in general education setting and special ed classrooms do not contain all or most of their peers. Let me pause you there real quick if yeah. I may, Madam Chair. That's the end. Who said anything about the only learning environment being a, a standard education course? It's not. And I will tell you, we intentionally did not define learning environment. I had this discussion with other individuals. Well, I wanted to define what learning environment means. Here's why it's a bad idea. Standard classroom, learning environment. Special education resource room, learning environment. Gym. Do you have gym class in there? Do you have other exercises in there that students use? If, if a class is using a gymnasium, play practice, musical practice, whatever that may be, that is your learning environment. If you have exercises going on in the playground, at the time, that is your learning environment. If the class is being held outside in the backyard of the school for whatever reason, that is what you would, con that is all good arguments that those are learning environments. And trying to define that and put up a list of, well, this counts as a learning environment and this doesn't. Candidly, Madam Chair, I think that's a bad idea. I'm just, inevitably there's going to be something excluded and something is going to be confusing. Um, so anyway, I sorry, I, and I read that comment many times as well. It's like, well, but they're not in the standard classroom. We didn't say classroom. We said learning environment, and that was intentional. I definitely have some flashbacks to COVID and when we were talking about moving classes outside, and anywhere can be a learning space. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to Jim Porter. He's got a couple of questions. Yeah, this is, of course, not a question. Many statements. Uh, I think we, we talked yesterday, and I think everybody clearly understands the, the original uh, charge of the emergency safety intervention uh, task force that was actually, I was about a three month member of this board when I was assigned to that responsibility. But I wanna go back further than that. And I have been critical of our past colleagues and what I'm gonna say now is I think uh, no, nobody is here that was here but I know as a, as a member of the board of the Kansas School Superintendents Association, I was assigned, as was the commissioner on times, to come and monitor the work of the Board of Education. And I was, and that was before we met here, but I was here several times when people from disability rights and other brought people that had been secluded or restrained improperly, and the stories were horrible. And the board listened politely talked about guidelines, debated whether or not they needed to do guidelines or, or, or uh, re regulations uh, came down on the side of just guidelines, and in my view, did not act appropriately, and so it became a legislative issue. Uh, and that's why occasionally when somebody comes and makes a presentation to this, I say, I think we need to follow up on that because because we need to keep control of that. That being said, I am not objective on this issue. I've been involved with it since the, I got here, you know, eight and almost eight and a half years ago now. I was involved in all the discussions, in all the meetings, and I believe, and, and all, I'm going to say this, I have had, in my view, a positive relationship with several of the organizations who have expressed their concern about this, and I have typically agreed with them, and I hope it doesn't hurt that relationship, but I don't now. Because I didn't see anything, based on, and I really appreciate the clarification, Scott, because I think that, uh, that you actually said what I was going to say, that I believe that there are many opportunities for de-escalation prior to seclusion, and you've gone over that, and I appreciate that. I am, I made it a point, because I know across the street, everybody tries to twist people's arms to do what they want them to do. I've made it a point not to poll the board. I don't know what my colleagues are gonna do. I haven't asked them. Uh, I'm gonna support it because I believe that, uh, that uh, 
hearing officer's decisions did not represent either the legislative intent or the intent of the task force. And this may be inaccurate, but the consequence of calling something seclusion that isn't, the only consequence is a parent gets a, gets a call, gets a contact, uh, and the department is located. And I don't see additional contact with the parents being a bad thing. So. Kathy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will tell you my big emphasis in all of this is trying to understand and help the parents who have called me about this evacuation of the classroom. So that is huge in my thinking in this and my heart in making sure something can be done about this constant happening that's apparently going on. So with that said, I do have two, a question on verbiage in um, 9142 2 under B, B, no, C2, I guess it would be, sorry, the numbering always gets weird. Changing the word must to shall. Um, could you explain why we would do that? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, if I may. Um, because the Department of Administration told us to. That's just, that was the preferred language. Yes. For, uh, functionally, it makes absolutely no difference in that sentence. Okay, because I would definitely see a must as more demanding than a shall. Um, and I've seen local boards mm -hmm. literally have that argument. So that concerned me um, on the I next. Apologize. It may have been the AG's office that told us to make that change. Somebody I forget did. which. Okay. Yeah. And then on the part um, on D, D1, next page on what I'm holding, when, so I was confused because when you were here last month and when you were in front of rules and regs, when you read this statement, your verbiage and what was on the screen for here, because I went back and watched it because I was confused, you said, you verbally said, instead of shall see and hear, you said must visually observe and hear. So I'm, that caught me, I guess, so it caught my attention. So. Just probably when I made that statement, I wasn't speaking as if I was reading the reg. And I, I'll put it this way: in in my world and legal world, court opinions and statutes generally are shall and may, not must. And so, out of habit, I may have said must, but it means the same thing. That's what shall means. It means you will do this. It's not optional. So if I said must instead of shall, it was a, it was not an intentional difference. Dina. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> when I'm reading one of the uh, letters that had concern, um, this person was talking about not finding specifics of how educators and school districts would be educated or trained in, uh, on the new regs. Do we ever include those kinds of things in our regulations? Is that included currently? No, you would not include I that in the, did in the, not in the language so. of the regulation, you would not. So, <clears throat> the, the scenarios that you shared, and I shared one that um, when I was teaching and how I dealt with students who needed to calm down, um, I had a cool down pass. So did that mean that, I asked Jim, does that mean that uh, I should have let their parents know that 
their child use that and walked around what was uh, the center of the building and happened to be my classroom. But this tells me, no, I would not have been um, secluding them because they made that choice to walk around and knew, in fact, they go get the pass themselves and walk around. So um, education is paramount with this. So will this be available through some sort of um, website or um, literally individuals going out to service centers and offering um, explanations? How, how will that be handled? So the training will, will take place and the professional development and the, the guidance will be like every other guidance that we make available. This particular tool is actually designed, that's why I like this. Uh, what we have is if you're a teacher and you know the link, or you, you, you can have it on your phone and go through it. And I get it, you're not going to do that in the middle of an emergency, right? Yeah. It's not gonna happen. I wouldn't it's want it to, after. right? But if you have to figure out afterwards, oh, I don't know if that's something I'm supposed to report or not, that's what the purpose of the tool is. Or practicing ahead of time, as you're doing your yearly professional development, it could be a tool. Yes, it's going to be widely published and available to everybody. I'll put some tweaks on the language, just as like the first page and last page, but yeah, it, it's certainly going to be made available. That's my goal. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I don't have really concerns about the definitions, I think all that can be taken care of with the tool and with training. But to Kathy's point, I, I understand a lot of the hubbub was about class clearing. Do these changes actually change anything about class clearing? Here in, my, in the intent and what, what I think we've done is if you have a student or students, maybe there's two of them for some reason, in a classroom, prevent, pre and it's creating a risk of injury to self or others, and you decide to evacuate that classroom or you remove everyone else, that is now considered to be a seclusion. Mm. Whereas that's not necessarily what the first version stated because it always required placement of the student somewhere. You're not placing, you're not placing me in the boardroom, I'm already here. Mm -hmm. But if you all leave for some reason, then you've secluded me. And but so you would be required to report that. Okay, but the decision to clear the class is not whether or not they clear the class, that's not changed. Is that what I understand? The, and to clarify, because I know this came up quite a bit, the decision to clear the class is not impacted by these changes. Okay. The Just ability to, to engage in seclusion, again, mm -hmm. you are only allowed to engage in seclusion or restraint if there is a risk of injury to self or others. So it is expanding what exclusion or, or what seclusion. seclusion, pardon me. It is expanding what seclusion means. So it doesn't change the decision making process, only what has to be reported. It only, in yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that teachers are not evacuating classrooms of all but one student unless there is a risk of Something injury. Bad. Okay. I'm, Thank you, that's helpful. That's an assumption, but that's. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam. Kathy. So in that scenario, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, who, who should be getting reported to? If we're clearing a classroom, we, we're not just talking about the child who they're dealing with. Every child has been affected in that scenario. So are we reporting to every parent that your child has gone through this because every child was put through something in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, to me, a huge deal as well. So the regulations, and I, I believe you've asked this question before, and that's why I think I know where you're coming from, I'm assuming here. These regulations specifically require notification in a timely manner to the child that was secluded. 
well, pardon me, to the parents of the child that was secluded. You have previously asked, and I think you're inquiring about the other classmates. Who is telling their parents? There is nothing in these regulations that require that. I don't believe that it's, it, it maybe it's happening, I don't know. Uh, but it's certainly not required by any regulation as written or as proposed. You could make that a requirement if you, if the board wants to, that is another, that's another conversation. But as of today, no, that's not a requirement. Dina. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, <clears throat> the statement that you made, made me want some clarification. So, if I have a student who has started, all of a sudden starts throwing furniture, if I take the rest of the class and leave the classroom, the child is secluded, correct? Let's walk through the scenario. I don't, want to, I don't want a mistake. Is that the same as it is now? Let's walk through here. Or through is my taking children, the rest of the children out of the room? Keep in mind. Sorry. In other words, I'm looking for contrast. Is it the same or under today's um, regulations, would it not be seclusion, but under the new amendments, it would be? Or is it the same, no matter what? Under, with the, as amended, or as the amendments are proposed, the definition of purposefully isolate includes separation of the student from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment by school personnel. That's the very long way of saying, if I've separated you from others, I've kicked everybody else out of the room except for maybe myself and a para, that would meet the definition of purposefully isolate. Okay. Now, whether or not that counts as a seclusion or not, if, if we may, let's, go, let's work through this because I know the question's going to come up. In your scenario, did school personnel remove the student from the learning environment? Yes. Did you, well, is the student still in the same the classroom? The student, no, the student wasn't removed. Okay. So the student we're talking about, me. Yes. You know, little Sky yes, Gordon. Sure. Yes, me. Here. Was I you taken out throwing. of the room? No. I'm throwing stuff around, which throwing stuff. may or may not have happened. Did school personnel separate me from all or most peers and adults in the learning environment? Yes. Well, Were, if the teacher decided to stay in the room and just sent the, the rest of the, the kids mm -hmm. to the hall, for example, Yep, that would still be because it's that is all still, or most. It, because at least the, their peers were That's removed. Right. That's right. Okay. And by the way, as a side note, I know the question came up yesterday. Well, how many people does it mean most? The, you, you can't legislate and decide every single scenario in a regulation. It's just you, you can't do it. And to say, well, you if you have more than three people in the room that's no longer seclusion, that's a bad idea because then every single time you're gonna make sure there's four people in there. So anyway, well, moving on from, so now we've got everyone except we, for me and you, we're the only ones in the boardroom. You've kicked everybody else out. This is our learning environment. Are you meaningfully engaged with me to provide instruction? Not unless I'm privately visiting with a child. Okay. Do you think it makes a difference? Probably, I mean, again, it, this is very case specific. If you are holding the door shut and you are talking to me and addressing me, it's like, okay, let's calm down. Let's count to 10. Tell me what's wrong. Arguably, that is a way of meaningfully engaging with me to provide instruction. If you're standing there and you're ducking my punches, 
and you're not you're you're just defending yourself probably not engaged with providing instruction no i think that uh, probably right. fair argument well my question mm -hmm. also is under today's regs is it would it be treated the same or would it be treated differently I would say that the regulation changes would require th there would be a different requirement than if the amendments are not made okay. I'm not saying that no child ever gets reported for seclusion when that happens and in fact uh, we've only had one case that's ever made it to my level to where the evacuation was the issue, and it was the one that happened in 2017. I don't know what gets reported at the local level to the parents about seclusion, but the reg change does clarify, or I don't want to say clarify, the change to the regulation does say that counts as seclusion, so don't let there be any doubt anymore, evacuation counts as seclusion. But, so you're saying it's or, clear what? what the issue that it is seclusion that assumes that people were not clear in the first place it okay. it puts in there it puts language in there that wasn't there before it does expand what it means to be secluded potentially again that adds to the definition of purposely isolate that doesn't necessarily mean it's seclusion because we're still going through here you've got me in the room you've got the door closed uh you're you are dodging my punches are you stopping me from leaving? Okay. No, I'm asking you, are you stopping me from leaving the room? Well, there are several, in my case, mm -hmm. there were several exits to the room, so yeah. I couldn't have stopped you from leaving out of every one of them. Okay, let's say there's a room. This is the room. So again, I'm asking the question. Are you stopping me from leaving the location? No. Okay. Did I have reason to believe I can't leave? Have you told me you better not leave this room? No. Did you tell me that I could leave the room at any time? No. Was I subject to any kind of in-school suspension, detention, or other appropriate discipline? No. probably subject to seclusion in our scenario. Okay. Without the changes to the regulation, I don't know that that would be true. A past hearing officer has found that evacuating other students is not the same thing as placing the student in the room and therefore does not count as seclusion. Okay. Thank you. Andy. Scott. Yes, sir. I think what Kathy has raised is what, since, since the original ESI regs went into effect and it's now played out, what they hear, and correct me if I'm wrong, what they are hearing is why in the world does a kid that disrupts the classroom get to stay in the classroom and my kids have to come out and be disrupted? So, Simple question, do these regulations address anything around that? If it's voted up or down, right. does that change that behavior? Uh, whether it's voted up or down does not change that. S because that's a practice of which people are making a decision. I just want that, that may help yeah. them in their decision making about what they do. So. That's a separate issue related to the core of ESI and its implementation, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, yeah. Betty. Okay. Having worked just as a representative on that committee, going in, uh, I thought, okay, this is pretty easy because I'm thinking of SPED students um, needing uh, their parents to be able to advocate and understand what's going on with them in the learning environment. When we mixed in uh, uh, general education, that's where it got c 
confusing to me. So the one thing that, you know, when people say, well, why does my kid have to be moved from the classroom? If it's an emergency and my kid's safety is threatened, you darn well better move them from the classroom. You darn well better separate them from that emergency situation. There is a distinction between what is an emergency situation, and it's well-defined. Harm to themselves or others. If my kid is at risk of being harmed, it's just like evacuating a building. If my child is at risk and you can save my child from harm by evacuating or removing them, then that's what you should do. The point I want to bring out is if you ask yourself, is this an emergency? Going back to what you said it was. Harm to themselves or to others. Was this an emergency? Then we go to what steps do we take, which is the seclusion. Um, I say that simply because it is a huge challenge to wrap your brain around all of this. It was so much work, so much discussion, so much intentional effort to not only meet the needs of the SPED students, but meet the needs of general ed students as well. And then to combine those two was also challenges. Now, I was limited to just that initial um, um, committee. I didn't go on as, as Mr. Porter did to level two. But I have to try to get people to understand we're talking about emergency safety intervention. Emergency. And if, if, if you buy into that and separate all of the outside chatter, what's being done in the interest of my child, whether that's a sped child or a general ed child? Were you intervening to ensure their safety? Now, the notification for those students whose parents have to advocate for them, which I looked at more the SPED students. Yes, they need to be identified. Yes, they want to know that this was being done because my kid can't come home and tell me, well, what was going on or why. Perhaps they don't understand that. So yes, that parent that has the responsibility to advocate for their students should be in every situation. Well, I mean, let me let me back off from that. That's going a little too far. Should be notified. That's the idea. And if you can see this as emergency, it's like if there's an active shooter and, and you, you, you move my kid, well, why did you move my kid? Why didn't you take the active shooter out? Come on, really? Somewhere we have to look at this with realism. Now, yes, I understand and appreciate those views that were brought to us. And I use the perfect example of I got this great recipe but because somebody didn't follow that recipe, do we throw the recipe out? No, maybe we t need to clarify what a pinch means, because a pinch to me and a pinch to you might be different. So maybe we need to get rid of the word pinching and say, well, that's a fourth of a teaspoon. Gotcha now. My point being, there are some great things you can't dismiss because you're trying to say, well, I don't understand what a pinch is here or a pinch is there. If we look at first and foremost, was there an emergency situation? And if you say yes to that, yeah, then all of the other stuff kind of falls in place. I am hoping 
just because of the time I spent on the committee. I'm hoping that putting that in some perspective will help, because it took me a minute to uh, separate what's time out, what's, why would you do this, why would you do that? And when you look at emergency and let that be your guiding factor, it kind of helps you wrap your brain around what's going on. Thank you for allowing me to share that. This is, this, <clears throat> this is going to show my age. I haven't been a middle school principal since 1977. One time during the time I was an emergency uh, 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 principal, and this was a whole lot, this was a long time before we started talking about emergency in, uh, intervention. I had an out of control kid in the classroom, and the quickest and safest thing for me to do was move every other kid out so I could deal with that student. I only did it once. It was, I have never second guessed that because that was the quickest way to keep them safe. I don't advocate one way or the other, but in that particular instance, that was the safe thing, but that, and that was not the reason I signed up to talk. I did that for the purpose of making the motion. And I moved that the Kansas State Board of Education adopt the proposed amendments to Emergency Safety Intervention Regulations, KAR 9142-1 and 9142-2. And a second from Betty. Um, so as a reminder to the board, this is a roll call vote. And so we will go down the line and we'll say yay or nay. Any last discussion or questions? Yay. Okay. Answer your vote. Yes. Yay. Yes. 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 Yay. Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, board. We are going to take a 10 minute break.
Thank you. Can I, uh, Craig, let me kick this off if you don't sure. mind. So one of the things that you're going to see in each uh, agenda, I think, uh, the board chair and vice chair and I talked about was, why don't we just have a time called a learning series where we take topics as if, Craig said, as if I'm just going to talk to a group of students that know nothing about school finance. Next month will be at risk, uh, risk works. So special ed will be one, we'll just do these one a month. So it's just, it's just an information, ask questions, and then we can do follow up if we need to. All right. Um, so I had a teacher tell me once it's easy to forget what you know. And that wasn't a commentary on old age, although I'm starting to recognize that better every day. Uh, it was more a reminder that in the case of Dale and I, we work with school finance every day. So there are things that we tend to accept as second nature just because we see it every day that not everybody else does. Uh, and so we've, we've got a little bit of a, a presentation that we use with a number of groups uh, and, and made some adjustments, hopefully for your benefit. And we'll, we'll see what we can learn as we go through and this is focused on how school districts are funded, what they do with their funding. And it's a little bit of a lead in because every year you are required to make a recommendation uh, on the budget for the uh, following year that would go to the state, through the governor, through the legislature. And if you're going to make that recommendation, it helps if you know a little bit about how school districts function and, and how their money flows and is spent and the laws that apply or don't apply as the case may be. Um, so since we're both former teachers, we get to start with this. <laughs> um, and unlike Randy, we're, we're not going to give you the answers and you tell us the questions. Um, and we're also not going to keep score. So write down your answers if you want, think about them, uh, type them on your computer. Nobody's going to run around with the camera behind you and see what you typed on your computer or wrote on your paper, so you're safe here. Very simple, straightforward. Uh, and given what, what you do every month, you can answer these a little better than some of the audiences that we visit with. So how many school districts are there in Kansas? This, this is it, by the way, short quiz, three. How many students are there in Kansas? We'll see how many were paying attention yesterday. You got some help on that. And what are the largest and smallest districts in Kansas? You know the largest, really. Imagine that. Yes. So let's look at it a little bit. There are, of course, 286 school districts. There are 90 accredited private school systems, and we don't know how many non-accredited. Non-accredited schools, I think we've mentioned it before, are required to inform the State Department, notify them when they start, and they provide an address and a contact person at that address, and that's it. That's the last information they're required to provide us. So since that includes homeschools, um, some of which get five, six months into it and decide this isn't quite what we bargained for, and they come back to public school, they're not required to notify us if they do that. So we literally don't know how accurate our list is. So we don't know how many non-accredited private schools there are. Um, students. And you saw some of this yesterday, 469,000 more or less in public schools, 26,000 in accredited. And again, we don't know non-accredited since we don't know how many schools there are. And they don't report to us. Accredited private schools do report that information to the department. So the largest and the smallest schools, Wichita has 46,000 students. Healy is our smallest at 38. So perspective, remember the total number of public school students, 469,000? 10% of our students are in one district. So m most people, when you ask that question, they can tell you Wichita is the largest district. I'm not, they don't always know the scale, but that's 10%. And the second largest district, anybody want to hazard a guess? Olathe. They're, they are headcount, they're about 28 to 29,000. They're creeping towards 30, real close. Um, so even though they're second largest, that's a big drop from 46,000. But also, look at that number median. 
if you list our districts in order, low to high, by headcount students, right in the middle, you're at 524. So we are very much a rural state with a lot of smaller school districts. Um, six, the top 16 districts have half of our students. So the other half of our students are in 270 districts. So that gives you an idea of, of some of the disparity that we have among our school districts. There's another way to talk about largest and smallest, and I think Dina was kind of headed there. It's not necessarily just number of students. Geographically, how big are you? Well, Syracuse is the largest. Galena is the smallest. Um, if, if you're not familiar with those, you could probably guess which part of the state Syracuse is, list, is located in. Um, but to help you out a little bit, you've probably seen this map quite a bit. There's our school districts. Syracuse is out on the Colorado border in southwest Kansas. You can kind of see where it's labeled there. Galena is on the clear opposite corner of the state, southeast corner. Um, they are sort of just a, uh, a suburb of Joplin, Missouri. They are right up against the Missouri border and just a few miles from Joplin. And if you look at the districts that are drawn in there, as a general rule, geographically, the larger ones are in the west, smaller ones are in the east. Um, there are some exceptions, obviously, but that just gives you an idea of the layout. As I say, you're, you're pretty familiar with that map and certainly with the numbers that are superimposed on top of it uh, in, in your districts and the school districts you represent. Characteristics of the students, we have about 88,000 who have an IEP that qualify for special education services. We have uh, a little over 44,000 that are English language learners, and you see just a few of the languages that are native to those students listed there. Uh, there are quite a few more, but that gives you an idea of, of some of the different uh, characteristics that students bring to school with them and teachers work with them. Learning programs, career tech ed, and I didn't get a head count on either of these two. Uh, there, there's some reasons it's easier to count FTE um, students with these. So the FTE or the full-time equivalent is 9,817.4 and we'll talk more about how you get to that number in just a little bit. Um, but it's interesting to note that the last survey we did, 97% of all students at some point during high school will take a, at least one CTE course. They won't necessarily be, they won't be a completer in a program necessarily, but they will at least be enrolled in one course at some point during high school. And then just short of 10,100 students, FTE-wise, are enrolled in virtual programs and participating at least part-time in those programs. Free meals, how many students qualify for free meals and what percent? There you see the highest across the state and the lowest. Um, somewhat interestingly, geographically, those two districts are not very far apart. And it's easy to look at Blue Valley and say, ah, it's only 8%, but look at the students. That's still about 1,900 students on free meals. And statewide, our average is 42%, 196,000 students. And note that it's free meals only. That does not include <coughs> reduced. And reduced price meals, I have to be careful how I say that. I tend to say reduced. We don't advocate reduced meals for any student. Reduced price meals, however, um, is a smaller percentage than free lunch. Free meals is one way to talk about the wealth of a district, and this becomes important when we look at how schools are funded. Uh, another way to look at it is, what's the property worth in that district? What's a home worth? There you see average residential appraised value, and again, the highest in the state, the lowest in the state, compared to the state average. That's a significant difference. 
and kind of similar to headcount enrollments, the difference between first place and second place is a pretty good gap. Second place is around 350,000, I believe, if I remember correctly. So it's a big drop from the Blue Valley District to, to others. You might guess there are not a lot of families supported solely by teacher salary living in the average priced home in Blue Valley. So in addition to residential value, how about the total assessed valuation? And the reason we want to know about assessed valuations, whether it's residential or total or what have you, is funding. Property tax is the only fund that school boards have access to. So total assessed valuation, again, Johnson County District leads the state in that area, and that's Shawnee Mission, and that is $4.2 billion. And the, the lowest is Dexter, which is in south central Kansas, southeast, depending on where you draw that line, uh, just under $10 million. So fairly significant <laughs> difference. But bear in mind, Shawnee Mission's $4.2 billion assessed valuation is serving 25,000 students. <laughs> Dexter's $10 million is serving 250 students. So how do you quantify that? We'll come to that a little later. That's your teaser. Um, all of that is not really just trivia to see what's, what you know about the state that you live in and what the differences are. That all factors in to this requirement. The legislature shall make suitable provision for the finance of the educational interests of the state. That's your state constitution, Article 6B. So the question becomes, <clears throat> knowing what you know, as well as what we just went through, how would you make suitable provision for financing the educational interests of this state? Well, I'm not going to make you answer that, but I'll tell you how it's been done, up to this point at least. Um, you start with, uh, as you would assume, funding each student. And they, it's based on an FTE enrollment, a full-time equivalent. So if a student only attends seven-tenths of the day, you're not going to fund them as a full-time student. They're a seven-tenths student. So in the funding formula, they would count as seven-tenths. And each student is funded at a set base amount. This is how much you get for every child that walks through your doors. And next year, it will be $5,088. Yes? You said if they only attend seven tenths of the day, then that's all they get funded at? Yes. So isn't there a threshold that if a student is under, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain number of hours, the district can't get funding for that student? At what granular level do you break down the funding per student? Uh, we fund to the nearest tenth, so we would fund nearest one tenth tenth students. Okay, uh, thanks. If they enroll in one course, they're receiving uh, funding for that course. So one question that arises if you're responsible for funding this is, why 5,088? How did we arrive at that level? Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> it involved the courts. And the Supreme Court defined what's adequate in the Gannon versus State, which is the most recent lawsuit. And you can see there, reasonably calculated. There was, there's debate over that, obviously, for all Kansas students to meet or exceed the standards set out in rows. Um, in the, the rows standards, I've got slides on those, but we'll save those for later if we happen to have time. Um, I'll just tell you that the short version, the rows standards uh, are in statute. They do not mention state assessments. They do not mention math specifically. They do not mention English. They talk much more about the goals that you set. What do the students look like when they're finished with school? That's what the Rose Standards refer to primarily. Uh, so that to be adequate in funding, it should be calculated so that all students can reach that mark. And with that in mind, uh, as the last lawsuit wrapped up, uh, the legislature set those dollar amounts in base in, as the base for each year moving forward. Uh, to lead up to where we're headed next year uh, so that moving forward from this point on onward, rather than a specific dollar amount, it increases 
the previous year's amount by the three-year average of the consumer price index. So the last dollar amount they set in statute, and those numbers you see on the left are actually spelled out in statute. It lists the year and that dollar amount. $4,846 is what we had this year. And then it says in each succeeding year, you'll take the prior year's base and multiply it by the three-year average of the consumer price index. Well, the three-year average uh, of the consumer price index right now is 5%. So 5% times 4,846, and increasing that gives us 5,088. For fiscal year 25, we'll take 5,088 times whatever the three-year average of the consumer price index mm -hmm. is at that point, and that number will become the base. The consumer price index uh, is agreed upon, that three-year average, by the Legislative Research Division, the Division of the Budget, and KSDE. So it's not, and it's the Midwest Consumer price index. We pull it off a chart and do the math. Then there are some weighting factors added. And that goes back to all the numbers we just walked through and the differences across the state. Um, Healy, with their 38 students, is required to provide an adequate education just like Wichita with their 46,000. Well, obviously, Wichita students at 5,000 apiece are generating a lot more money than Healy's at 5,000 apiece. So there's a low enrollment weighting factor. There is an at-risk weighting factor, which is based on the number of students that have free meals. We'll talk more about each of these in just a couple of minutes. Uh, there's also a pre-kindergarten at-risk program that's funded by the state. Bilingual, for those students that come in to school and they speak a different language. Career and tech ed has a weighting factor, and then transportation. We'll talk a little bit more about each of them here as we go along. So low enrollment and high enrollment. That's a little misleading the way that's written, but low enrollment, I mentioned last night, I'm sure you remember vividly, um, <laughs> is on a sliding scale. The smaller the school district is, the higher the factor they get. And the factor means, if you look at that section on the left, 100 FTE equals 1.014331. We'll call that one. Every student you have enrolled receives an additional 1.0 weighting, so an additional $5,088 if you're that small. As your enrollment grows, you get to 200, 300, 400, that factor gets smaller because of the economies of scale. If you're large enough, you can pay for all the classes you need to have without quite so much additional weighting. But if you're very small, you don't have a chance. And again, go back, the median-sized district in Kansas is 524 students. So we rely on low enrollment weighting across the state. So the smaller, I'm sorry, the larger the district gets, the smaller the weighting gets until 1,622, and then the factor stays at 0 .035 the rest of the way up. Uh, so Wichita and who would be at 1,600, McPherson, is probably bigger than that, but nevertheless, they have the same weighting. Once you hit 1,622 students, it's locked in the same all the way through. So everybody receives either low enrollment weighting or high enrollment weighting, it's, but it is a sliding scale. The smaller you are, the more you receive. Yes, sir. Based on our conversation yesterday, <coughs> if a <coughs> district with a high enrollment weighting takes a school takes a student from a closed school, does that affect that rating? Uh, no, reason being, and, and I'll, everybody understand the question? No. Yesterday, one of the things they put in legislation is that if you accept a student from a neighboring district that closed a school, or not even neighboring, from a district that closed a school, you get to use your prior year's low enrollment weighting factor. And the reason is what you're seeing here. If I add students while I'm growing, that means my low enrollment weighting factor on the scale got smaller. But if I get to use last year's when I, was, when I had fewer students, now my low enrollment weighting factor is higher and I can multiply all my students by one instead of by 0.9 and gain extra money. So I, I believe what Mr. Porter is asking is, what if I'm one of the high enrollment district schools? So what if I'm Salina? 
I've got more than 1,622 students, and a student from a school that was closed last year enrolls in my district. Does that apply to me? Yes, it applies, but it doesn't do anything because I'm bigger than 1,622, so my uh, low enrollment weighting is always 0 0.035040. Last year, I was bigger than 1,622, so it was still 0 0.035040. So whether I'm using last year's or this year's, if I'm a large school, that, that change in law doesn't affect me. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so that, that's the first weighting. People tend to forget about it uh, because it's, it's just there. It's built into the, to the law. Is this my next one? Yeah. Next one is at risk and pre-K at risk. They are based on the number of students you have qualifying for free lunch. That's what generates the money. Uh, so right under the bold type at risk, you see free lunch student head count multiplied by 0.484. So if you've got 100 students qualifying for free meals, you multiply that by 0.484, you're getting 48.4 additional students counted in your enrollment and you're gonna multiply that 48.4 times $5,088. That's how you generate the money, is the students that qualify for free meals. We confuse you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say if more districts make the decision like Topeka did just to provide meals for everybody, how are they gonna get that head count or have they figured that out yet? Uh, we've figured that out, it's happened before. Yeah. Uh, maybe not district-wide, but in other schools. Um, so the, the issue is there's a provision in the USDA guidelines that controls uh, school meals. If a high enough percentage of your students are direct certified for free meals, so they qualify by means of another uh, social program, Medicaid for instance. If they qualify for Medicaid, then they automatically qualify for free meals. They don't have to fill out the application and prove their eligibility. They've already done that. If enough of your students qualify through the direct certification process, you can choose as a district to have all your students eat free because that percentage is high enough. Typically the breaking point is about 60%. So 60% of your kids qualify direct certification. You can choose to have everybody eat free. Um, so the, the question becomes, if everybody's eating free, are we now 100% free meal? So we get 100% of our kids counted as at risk. And the, the short answer is no. Um, those that are not direct certified have to fill out the household economic survey, which is a tool that we had to develop because USDA won't let you use the free meal application if you're doing direct certification. Uh, but it mirrors the free meal application. We used it during COVID when everybody ate free to qualify for this funding, the way the state statute's written, um, if they're not direct certified, they have to meet the income criteria. So you can't just say, we decided to see, feed everybody free so everybody counts. Mm. So those that are not direct certified will still fill out a form and prove uh, income status. So good question. Um, so we confuse you a lot of ways through here, but this one in particular, mm -hmm. we use at risk to refer to two different groups of students. Free lunch students determines how much money you're going to receive to provide services. You provide services to any student who's at risk in your building. Re income doesn't matter after that point. Once the money comes into your district, you determine which students are truly at risk and that need to have the services provided. Um, most districts can probably quote, uh, tell you of years that their valedictorian was on free meals. Uh, so it doesn't particularly, they don't, uh, one doesn't lead to the other. The reason it's used though is there is research uh, across the country that the number of students qualifying for free meals in a lot of cases is a pretty good proxy for the number of students that you have that are at risk. So they, that's why they relate the two. Hmm. Pre-K at risk is a little bit different. Uh, preschool students now age three and four who are at risk by definition of nine different criteria, one of which is income. Uh, but there are other criteria as well and they're all listed on our website. 
uh, single parent families is one, there's a, a number of others. If the student meets one or more of those criteria, then they're eligible for mm. the pre-K at risk program. And Amanda talked to you about those a little bit yesterday mm -hmm. afternoon. Those students are funded at 0.5. I know she talked to you about, it wasn't that long ago, kindergarten students were only funded at 0.5. Now that's reserved for the pre-K. Another waiting factor, bilingual. Um, if a, when it's obviously when a student enrolls and they're speaking a different language, you need to provide some different services. All of these weightings are because you're providing different services or different supports for those particular students. And those typically cost money. There's two different ways to count bilingual for, F, for funding purposes. Um, and it's because there's research tied to both of these ways. And rather than picking one over the other, they put them both involved. One way is to take your head count, just how many bilingual students do we have, multiply it by 0.815, and that gives you a number. The second way is how many hours does that student spend with a teacher who is endorsed in English as a second language. They have that on their license. Take that number of hours and multiply it by, convert it to a, a FTE by dividing it by 60 minutes in an hour and multiply that by 0.395, that gives you a different FTE. You get to use the higher of those two. You calculate it both ways and you use the higher number. <coughs> and whatever that number is, let's, let's say the bilingual headcount works out to be, uh, I'll use nice round numbers, uh, 12, the contact hours works out to be 11, 12's higher, you take 12 times 5,088, that's the funding you're going to receive to help with bilingual services. Career and tech ed, you may ask why is there a waiting for career and tech ed? Typically, those classes tend to be a little smaller, so you don't have as many students generating the funding, and they often require specialized equipment uh, that's a little more expensive. So quite some time ago, a waiting was added for career and tech ed courses, and it's just 0.5, regardless of which course. Uh, but it's based on contact hours, like the bilingual. So if, if you have a student taking a career tech ed course, you don't get to count an extra 0.5 for every class he's taking, just for that one hour that he's in a career tech ed course, or three hours that she's in a career tech ed course, whatever it might be. You convert those hours into an FTE and multiply that by 0.5 with the weighting. And if it sounds confusing, I will tell you this is one area that districts struggle with. Um, not because that part's horribly confusing, but everybody's got a different schedule. If I, am I on a block schedule? Am I on a traditional seven hour day schedule? Is it an eight hour day schedule? Whatever the case might be, and all of those make the hours work out differently. Um, so our auditors just know when they go to a district, they're probably going to have to look at CTE counts fairly closely and, and help districts with it a little bit. Transportation. Um, first, as you're probably well aware, to qualify for transportation, you have to live two and a half miles or more from school. There is, the formula is based on a density factor. So go back to our examples um, between Syracuse and Galena. Galena probably has their buses parked and Syracuse hasn't picked up the first child yet just because of the distance they're covering. The density factor is part of the formula because it makes a difference if I'm driving 20 miles and I'm only picking up three kids that are generating funding for that route or if I'm driving 20 miles and I'm picking up 30 kids that are generating funding for that route. So there is a density factor built into the formula uh, that helps with the state aid on that. And school districts, uh, state aid for transportation is limited to 110% of what they actually spent the prior year. So if their waiting generates a large amount of money, the legislature is not just gonna send it out if you're not actually spending that much, it's, it is capped at 110% of the prior year expenditures. 
Then there are some additional weighting factors uh, that work a little differently. I'm sorry, was there a question? So um, on, on uh, hazard was never one of those that was weighted, no. the hazardous routes. Hazards on the route have never been defined or weighted. Uh-huh. Okay. And I, I can also add to that. Yes. Could, could well be a topic of discussion. The, the issue there, and you will talk about it, I'm sure, more next month, you typically do, um, the two and a half mile distance. Uh, I doubt if many of us, even though we like to claim that we did back in the old days, walk two and a half miles every day from school. Uh, certainly not many kindergarten students do. Uh, in the snow, uphill both ways, all that good stuff. Um, and a lot of districts will pick up students less than two and a half miles. They just don't receive any funding to, to help cover that cost. They just choose to do it. Some charge a fee to do that, some don't. Um, for a number of them that do that, it is because of safety reasons. This, within that two and a half miles, the student has to cross a highway or they're walking on a highway or there are no sidewalks or there's a railroad track or um, there's a, a long list <coughs> of reasons that schools will transport students that live less than two and a half miles from school. Yes, sir. Uh, activity buses, how, how does that work into this? Extra? There, there is no state funding for activity buses. This is a, this only applies to regular routes. Good question. There, is, is there funding through uh, um, Keisha and other like activities no, budgets sir. or whatever that no. okay that's just a that's activity just a, yes act, activity routes um, are funded from your general fund okay. that, that you might have used someplace else uh, but needed to use there so Craig <clears throat> for the, like the 21st program in Olathe <clears throat> where I might live by Olathe South but I'm I want to be a teacher so I'm going to go to Olathe East that's far kind of far away it's going to be more than 2.5 miles <clears throat> so do they work out a contract with those kids since that they're going to all these different high schools based off the program that they're going into? The, if, if I understand correctly, the two and a half miles applies from your home to your assigned school. So uh, I may live next door to this school, but I've been assigned to attend over here. If that's right. more than two and a half miles, I qualify for transportation. <clears throat> if I'm <throat> going here just because I chose to, you, you but they, they have to determine. They have to determine by eighth grade going into ninth grade, which high school they're going to be going to if they want oh, to get into the 21st century program. It's kind of like the CAPS program, but CAPS, you have to you have to pay your own way. Like, you have to pay your gas to get all the way to CAPS and back to the high school if you have a job or wherever. Uh -huh. it, it's far from our home, but because that child chose to go into that program, they don't fund that. I didn't, I didn't know if that's worked out district by district, or I just want people to know if they think, I'm going to go into this new um, enrollment thing, I'm gonna to try to get into Blue Valley because I wanna do the CAPS program. That funding is not, that transportation is not funded by the, that you have to pay your way to get to that, that facility. So I wondered about, about ninth through 12th grade, they're in a program, a specific program that they've, it's either right. teaching or over here, I'm gonna go to, into <coughs> firework or fi be a firefighter. They have to determine that by eighth grade into what program they're, they're going to go to and then they have to be accepted into that program. So if, if it's educational, is that are they provided transportation? Craig, I think I can answer this. Okay. Um, Good. Olathe's so <laughs> website, um, because it's a local, that's a local decision. Mm -hmm. um, they decided to have their academies. That's something that their board oversees. And so for Olathe, um, there's essentially a pay-go option. So if you want your student to ride the bus, then you can pay for them to ride the bus. So they pay. They pay. If they're a, going to an academy. Okay. So they pay a bus. They pay for yeah. the bus to pick. Pay, but they have to pay that. There's a fee there, and yeah. that's in a contract. That's the contract that they chose to do. Correct. Yeah, I believe correct. the state aid would be tied to the building closest to you that you would normally attend. I mean, if you've chosen to go somewhere else, well, that's yeah. fine. But the district's not going to receive state aid for that. What if they have cards and debit and pay? Or no. 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 It's local. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. Got me, got me thinking about. It. Yeah, but, me too. <laughs> but if, because because the district can assign a student to any school they want. Right. So if Michelle is a parent and, and the district of Olathe says, 
we're going to let you choose which high school you go to because of programming. Does that become the, the school then that they're assigned to? Yeah, but I think they take them to their home school and then bus them over, don't they? The, I think that's how they do it. I'm saying, could I like to say that is now their home school? Yeah, I think we need to talk about that more because I'm confused too. This is what we do early in the morning at 7 o'clock yeah. and we're having this conversation right um, now. Right? I, I think there would be, there might be, I don't know, a difference between how the program's set up. Here's your, it may be, Olathe has said, here's your high school. If you want to be in a different program, you can choose to go somewhere else. And if that's the case, state aid would apply to, well, here's your high school. There are situations where, um, and, and it happens a lot more often probably with special education. The student needs specific services. We only make that available over here. We're going to assign you over there. And special education gets into a different set of transportation funding, in which case it, that is provided, uh, if that's what the IEP calls for. So I'm not sure that that's not an apples and oranges comparison, but that's the best I can make at this point. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, he agrees he's confused too. So. <laughs> I'm not confused. I, I think it really matters if the, if the choices of the school make them better. I'm going to address the magnet school system in Wichita. They just bus them. And I believe they get reimbursed for that busing. I could be wrong. You don't know either. I, 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 I don't know, but I'm not going to tell If you, you want to know who's <laughs> really going to weigh in on this conversation, it will be Laurel Murdy, right. the director of audit. Yeah, that's right. But, the, but the, the, if you want to know and you, and you just want to come to an early morning meeting tomorrow morning, we'll probably kick this around a little bit and then talk to Laurel because it is an interesting question, right, that we did, was never anticipated because usually a district says this is your home school, and for most of you there is only one. Uh, but... So in, in situations where um, <clears throat> they did not go in and change boundaries, so okay. this is your base school, but because we're now crowded, uh -huh. we have a situation, we now have to transport a certain number of students outside of those boundaries to another school. Um, would they have to do a boundary change where um, in the first no. situation you were able to uh, walk or whatever, now because of overcrowding and we didn't change the boundaries, you now have to go to um, another school? I, this is just my first guess. In that case, the student didn't get to choose, did they? They were told you will go over, mm -hmm. you will now go to Wichita East instead of some other school. Yeah, I, and I guess because you're saying they determine the base school, uh -huh. th that base school is, is determined by the boundaries that, that have been associated with, with each school. But yes, the, the district, and, and I ask yeah. this because it recently occurred um, there was an overcrowding in one high school. Instead of building another high school, now we have um, underutilization in this high school. So instead of looking at that, we just say, okay, parents, you have the option of selecting to have your kids go to um, school B. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the district has determined, okay, your kid's going here. They give the parents a, a choice, uh, but they didn't change the boundaries. That, that gets a little sticky. I, I understand they gave the parents the choice. We'd have to talk about that one too. So what you're seeing here is a real good example of what happens when we try to apply state statute to 286 districts some of which have 992 square miles, some have 13 and a half, some have 46,000 students, some have 38. It's not always a real 
cut and dried process. So they have to actually document for each student that we're now going to provide you that documentation. Has <coughs> we, good question. Uh, our auditors go to every district every year and verify all of these counts, all the weightings that you're seeing here, mm. and they do it for each student. Mm -hmm. Are they really enrolled in a CTE course for two-tenths of the day? Do they really live two and a half miles from school? Mm. And in the old days, in, if it was close, uh, that meant literally driving to the house a lot of times. And measuring would to do the that. front door. Yes, mm -hmm. wow. driving from the school to the front to the house. Now with GPS, we can actually do it much more accurately just sitting on our computer. Uh, but that is done for each individual student. And so when we get a list of exceptions from a school district, they'll list the students all by name and student ID number. Here's their exception, how far they actually live in this case, or how many hours they were enrolled in CTE or not enrolled in CTE. I didn't mention in the career tech ed, it has to be an approved career tech ed program. Uh, approved by our agency, uh, so there, sometimes that's an issue. This course wasn't actually approved, so you don't get to count those kids. So there's a number of factors, but the, the point of, of all this is our auditors check each student every year in each district. Now, obviously, when they go to Wichita with 46,000, they pull samples. They don't necessarily pick each in identifiable student. Uh, but depending on the weighting factor and the questions that arise, they'll check an awful lot of them. Even when my kids were in school, the buses would not go to gravel anymore. So they were paying parents mileage. Yes. Is that still occurring? If you were driving over, I think it was the two and a half miles, to get them to the bus, because literally I would have to drive my kids to the bus at the end of where the pavement stopped and get on the bus, but they would reimburse mileage for that. In the district that I'm familiar with, uh, we actually had that where we paid mileage to the parents. We had one true route bus that ran a route, picked up students, but all of the other students from this direction, we paid mileage, and we would audit those in the fall semester and then also in the spring semester, and we would calculate that. Parents would say they made this many trips and we'd send them a check in January and then send them a check also in June. But it still does happen, yes. And the statute says shall provide transportation. And that's one of the ways you, you shall, you may be allowed to provide transportation. And during COVID, uh, when districts had trouble getting drivers, they just didn't have enough drivers, they couldn't run enough routes, uh, a number of districts did that temporarily, in addition to the few that we have that, that do it all the time. All right, um, so the other weighting factors, and, and these are listed separately because they all have a different formula. They're not necessarily based strictly on the same FTE that those earlier weighting factors were. Special education, in fact, is not based on the number of students you have, uh, which surprises people a lot of times. It's based on your transportation costs specifically for special education. Does the student have an IEP that requires them to be transported? Uh, there's funding provided for that. Catastrophic expenditures. I don't like using that word referring to students, but that's the word that's in statute. So if their needs are high enough that it's truly uh, exorbitantly expensive, that's my word, then there's an additional amount of aid provided to help cover the cost for those students. Uh, Medicaid replacement was written into the statute a number of years ago for districts that provide Medicaid reimbursable services uh, by, from their own staff to students. Uh, Nine million dollars is set aside every year and split up amongst the districts to cover those services. And that's based on a specific count in April. Um, and then the rest of the money is divided up based on the number of teachers and paras that you have. Uh, so after we pay, well, we'll do that later. Those, those are the things that we provide weighting for, those four factors. None of them deal with how many students do you have. It's really tied primarily to how many teachers do you have, how many teachers in Paris. Virtual students are funded on a different formula. 
If you have a full-time virtual student, they're funded at $5,600. No weightings apply to virtual students. It's just strictly a, a flat dollar amount, the base amount of $5,600. If they are part-time, they receive $2,800 per FTE. So if you're a half-time virtual student, you're getting half of $2,800 in that district, or $1,400 for that student. So it's a fairly significant drop when a student goes from full-time to part-time for virtual services. And then if you're an adult student, which is defined as age 20 or over in the statute, or if you're younger than that but you dropped out and you're coming back for, to uh, do some kind of credit recovery, the funding is $709 per credit earned with a limit of six credits for any one student. So there's three different funding levels for virtual. It has its own little formula, um, and that can get a little complicated for auditors sometimes. And then the last one, or the last two actually, are local revenue sources. We talked a little bit about cost of living yesterday afternoon because this one just changed uh, if the governor signs the bill. Um, Cost of living goes back to that issue of what's a house cost in your district. What we saw with the differences between Blue Valley and I believe Copeland was lowest this year. Um, if housing in your district is 115% of the state average, then you can add an extra weighting to your enrollment, but it's funded only by local property tax. There is no state aid provided. So as a result, a uh, number of the districts that qualify for it which next year we think there will be 27 qualify for this. Mm. Um, at the moment, seven, I believe, actually use it uh, because of the property tax issue and not wanting to raise that. Um, so obviously, if, if 27 qualify, I think there's 259 that do not qualify, don't have the option to increase their general fund this way. Ancillary facilities uh, is the term that's in statute, but it refers to rapidly growing districts. If you've been growing really rapidly and you're opening new facilities, you passed a bond issue to help pay for the building itself, but there are other costs that go with opening a new facility. And if you're rapidly growing, like some of our districts have, we have districts that every three or four years have had to add a new school. Well, that, that keeps adding up over time. So ancillary facilities allows those districts, if they get approval from the Board of Tax Appeals, to increase their general fund by a set amount that's approved by the Board of Tax Appeals. But again, that's all local property tax, so there are not many districts that actually use that. One, they have to be rapidly growing to start with, and two, willing to increase their property tax more. So, but there are a few that make use of ancillary facilities weighting. Okay. What's next? Okay. So, given all that, how do you determine what your general fund is? How much money do I have? Well, go back to your FTE enrollment. How many kids do we have? How many are part-time, full-time? Add them up. In, in our district, we've got 525.2, so we're about a median-sized district. Our weightings, when we add them up, uh, are 503.4. So when we add up bilingual, when we add up career tech ed, uh, when we add up all those other weightings, including low enrollment weighting, we're adding another 503.4, like we had that many students. That gives us what we call the total weighted FTE, and that's what we're going to determine our budget on. So at 1,028.6, we multiply by 5,088, and there we are. But virtual aid is set aside, so we happen to have some virtual students. We're going to add another 7,100. And there's our general fund budget, 5,240,617. And I didn't make those numbers up. Those are coming from one of our actual districts. That's what you, you know what your general fund budget is. Pretty simple. The difficulty is in counting those weightings. Um, but once you get that done, the math is not that hard to work out. But there's another fund. Uh, the supplemental general fund, also, you'll also hear it called the local option budget. It's intent, it was originally, back in 1992, intended to add additional programs beyond the basics. 
when the formula changed at that time, some districts were used to spending more money than what the formula allowed them to do. So your general fund is based on the number of students you've got. You're locked in. It doesn't matter how much money you raise locally. That's your budget. You can't raise more money and raise the budget. It's tied to the number of students you've got for the general fund. There's other options we'll look at in a minute you can adjust. So that, that's what it is. Well, when the formula changed, there were a number of districts that were used to being able to spend a little more than that. So the supplemental general fund was put in place to allow them to do that if they chose to. Um, the maximum you can have for a supplemental general fund is 33% of the general fund amount. And that's, for the most part, simple math. Take 33% of your general fund and that's what you get. You'll see some exceptions here in a minute. When it was originally put in place, the thought was it would phase out over time. As the general fund kept increasing, you wouldn't have the need for an LOB. Well, in reality, that's not the way it worked out. Uh, everybody has a supplemental general fund. In fact, now you're required to have at least 15% or 18%, 15? Okay. Uh, and, and they picked 15% when they put it in law because everybody was already above that number. So they weren't asking anybody to raise their property taxes. You calculate it very similar to the general fund. You add up all your weightings and your enrollment. The exception is you don't count special ed when you add it up, and you don't count virtual students. So in our district, our total weighted FTE less special ed is 888.7, and we multiply that by our $5,088. That's the base amount for the LOB. And then special education gets added in separately because there's a provision in law you use your current year's special education allotment or what you had in 2008-2009. And for a lot of districts, 2008-2009 is still a higher number. So they add a, a higher number than what they're actually receiving this year. You add those two together and you get a new base amount for the LOB of 5136000 in our district, we use a 31% LOB. We haven't had a special election to allow us to go to 33. So we take 31% of that number, and we're getting an extra $1.6 million that we can use for, for general operating expenses along with the general fund. Questions on that so far? Yes. Uh, where are we getting the money extra? The supplemental general fund, you're getting part of it from the state, depending on the wealth in your district, and part of it locally, property taxes, which is part of the reason for the name local option budget. The board gets to decide how much of this they actually want to implement. Do you want to do 31%? Do you want to try to have an election to go to 33? Do you want to stay at 28? And the property tax determines that decision an awful lot of the time. Craig, take everyone back to 92. Okay. And, and because it's important for you to know. And the theory was, hey, if I'm going to run a really good debate forensics program, I'm, it may cost me more money and that'll be supplemental. But it was to phase out. Why didn't it phase out? Didn't phase out because the primarily, and the base for the general fund did not increase uh, rapidly enough to catch up with what was being spent in the LOB and it didn't increase rapidly enough for districts that didn't have an LOB to be able to continue providing the base amount of funding. And so the state's been in court a couple of times, Montoy and Gannon, addressing that factor that they've had to rely, in part, addressing that factor. Uh, they've had to rely more and more on the LOB for a, the primary function of your school, for the daily operations. Well, and you guys would know the numbers better, but I know the reason they did a new formula in 92 was because some districts were having to tax like 100 and some mills to keep the school doors open, and others like Blue Valley would be 10 or 15 mills, and they said this is just not sustainable and we can't be taxing rural folks 100 mills for school and make this work, so they decided we we're going to redistribute the wealth and um, so that those tax liabilities could come down. But like you said, they never did keep up with inflation. And the other thing is, 
the amount of base state aid was never actually based on what it cost to educate a student. It was just a negotiated number. What we could agree to, if I'm saying that correctly, yes. that could pass and get 63 votes in the House and 21 in the Senate and the governor's signature. It was never based on what it really costs to provide a great education. And so when they didn't keep up with inflation, then we had Montoy in 2005. We got another 250 some million, I think. But again, that wasn't based on what it cost to educate a child. It was what you could get the court agreed to and the legislature to fund. And then all Gannon really was, was Montoy plus interest because they, they didn't follow their own law that said we're going to increase every year based on inflation. But in 2018, the legislature, um, when they were in court, decided they did, they hired somebody, um, WestEd, to do a study of what it really cost to meet the Rose standards and the board goals. And they hired WestEd because they thought they would lowball the number like they had in some other places. And when the number came back, they said, well, if you just want to tread water, you need to add 500 million a year. If you want to actually meet the goals, what was it, 60% was based on our numbers. Like 90% of the kids would be like level two or above. You're going to have to add another 1.6 billion a year. And if you want to actually meet the goals that we set out with the 75% and all that, it was going to be 2 billion a year. Well, you know what number they picked? 500 million. So I must be psychic or something. But so if we're not, um, you know, making all the goals we set out and we're not having, you know, 75% of our kids in three and four, it's because they never funded us to get there, ever. I'm glad you brought that up. I wasn't going to use this slide, but since you brought it up, I did. And that helps me realize there's a typo. That lower right hand number should be 2.2, I believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but that's, that is all correct. When the formula changed in 92, the, the issue at that time uh, for the old formula, where did I leave off? There we go. Um, was the property tax disparity across the state. Some districts had five, six, eight, nine mills, and others had a hundred or more just to provide education. And so the state, uh, tried to level that out and provide state aid so that the, the, the shorthand statement was your address should not determine the quality of your education. And so the state tried to provide state aid to level the mill rates out a little bit. But by doing that, then they had to put a cap in place. And that's the way the general fund works. Based on the number of students you have, that's all you get to spend. And for some districts, they were used to being able to spend more, so they were understandably upset that you're cutting us off. And that's how the LOB came to be born. But over time, as, as we said, it's, it's now just part of the general operating expenditures for every district in the state. Okay. So review a little bit um, or explain how the money works. When the, when the money comes to the district, it all comes into their general fund or their supplemental general fund in the upper left-hand side. And then when you need to spend it on one of these other programs that you're receiving waiting for, we don't send you a separate check for at risk or a separate check for bilingual. It all comes into the general fund or the supplemental general. Um, and I'll be, I just noticed several of you taking pictures of the slides. I can make the slides available for you. That's not a problem. Um, so they get their money in the general fund and the supplemental general fund, and then they transfer it into the other funds. And in some cases, there are statutes that tell them how much they have to transfer into a specific fund. In other cases, they have options on how they do that. But if you're going to spend money on career and post-secondary education, you spend the money out of the career and post-secondary education fund. So you have to transfer money over there to start with. Um, so the, the the important note there is the money all comes into the general fund and the supplemental general fund. There is some federal money that will go directly to food service. There are some that will go to directly to special education. But state money typically comes into general fund and supplemental general. 
the, the other exceptions are the two on the right-hand side, capital outlay, bond and interest. Those state aid payments come directly into those two funds. That will be important to note where the money comes from and how you get it into special education here in a few minutes. So the other issue that the states had to deal with and districts have had to deal with goes back to that property tax. So in 92, they tried to level it out across the state and were reasonably successful, but there are still some places where it makes a huge difference. So the court, in the same court cases, defined what equity is. How do we make it equitable regardless of where the student lives? And there you see their def definition. And again, some of those terms are going to be open to discussion, what's reasonable. Um, substantially similar educational opportunity, and then the, the kicker is that last phrase, through similar tax effort. So the state provides state aid for a number of these funds, and it, it goes back to this issue right here, total assessed valuation. Obviously, Shawnee Mission is going to raise a lot more money than Dexter is, and to, to determine state aid, we tie it to the assessed valuation per pupil to get around that issue of the fact that there's 25,000 students in Shawnee Mission and, and maybe 250 in Dexter. So we take the total assessed valuation in a district and divide it by the number of students they have. And that gives us a number for every district in the state. There you see the assessed valuation per pupil for the highest district in the state and the lowest, Burlington and Galena. I set Fort Leavenworth off to the side because they're a little unique in a lot of regards, but in this one in particular, they're on a military reservation. It's federal property, which is not taxable. They have a little bit of private property. Um, they have a fast food restaurant. I don't remember if it's Burger King or, or Hardee's. Yep, you know. Somewhere on the post. And they, they have a credit union, and I'm told they have a private railroad. But in any event, that's all the private property they have that's taxable. So their assessed valuation per pupil is pretty low, and it stays there. It, it doesn't grow since there's not much property uh, like some other districts do. But that's the range of assessed valuation per pupil. Um, Burlington, you may know. Why is their assessed valuation so high? Nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plant. Uh, and if you're curious, second highest is uh, Caw Valley District which is Rossville and St. Mary's, they have a power plant too. It's coal-fired instead of nuclear. But So if you're going to be a small district and you want to bump up your assessed valuation, you need to build a power plant. Um, Galena is the lowest and, and typically is. For what it's worth, student numbers-wise, those two districts are about the same size, Burlington and Galena. But that's the disparity in their assessed valuation per pupil. So how does the equalization formula work to try and level up those property tax uh, abilities in local districts? In the general fund, everybody by state law levels 20 mils. Uh, and that money comes to the state now. It's no longer kept locally. That's not enough to cover anybody's general fund budget. A number of years ago for Burlington and Hugenton for a long time, 20 mils was more than enough, and they actually sent the state extra money because 20 mils covered their budget. Doesn't anymore. So everybody levies 20 mils, sends the money to the state, and then the state just sends them. In our district, the general fund budget was 5.2 million, I think. The state sends them 5.2 million. Some of it comes from the 20 mils property tax. Some of it comes from other sources, other taxes that the state has. So that's the way they equalize the general fund. Essentially, the state funds it, but they use your 20 mils to help with it. For the other funds, supplemental general fund, capital outlay, and capital improvement, which most people know is bond and interest, it's based on that assessed valuation per pupil. And we'll walk through that somewhat quickly. Each one of them has a different formula, naturally. So local option budget, we rank the assessed valuations per pupil in order, low to high. Lowest in the state, highest, so Galena up to Burlington. Go 81.2% of the way up the list, and that district receives no state aid. As you move down the list, you receive more. 
So let's say that district's assessed valuation per pupil is 170,000. If you're a thousand below that at 169,000, you get 1%. At 168,000, you get 2%. So every thousand dollars you drop, you get an extra 1% of state aid. Most of the formulas have that factor built in. But their starting points are all different. So for capital outlay, which is what you use to maintain your buildings, we still use assessed valuation per pupil. We still rank them low to high, but we start at the median instead of starting at 81.2%. So who's in the middle? That district receives 25,000, or I'm sorry, 25% of their, uh, their capital outlay budget is provided by the state. The rest is local property tax. Each $1,000 you are below, you receive another 1%. So if you're 1,000 below the median, you're getting 26% state aid, and so forth down the list. If you're above that, 1,000 above, you're receiving 24%, all the way up until a number of districts don't receive any state aid. They raise their, all their money locally. That's the way those two funds work. Capital improvement is the final fund, but there's actually four different formulas in capital improvement, depending on when you had your bond election. If your bond election was held prior to July 1 of 15, and a lot of those are starting to run out because you pay off the bonds typically for 20 years. There's a few that are 25 or 30. But if you held your election prior to July 1 of 15, the state aid formula is the same one we've got for capital outlay. We start at the median, 1% uh, if you go above, 1% below. If you had your election after July 1 of 15, state aid is tied to the lowest assessed valuation. So we still got our list, low to high, we start at the district that's lowest and they get 75% state aid. And then every thousand dollars you are above that, you receive, that should say, yes, you receive 1% less state aid. So we'll come back to that in just a second. So after July 1 of 15, we've got a different formula. They changed it a year later and threw in the fact that if you have strictly extracurricular facilities, that are included in that bond issue, we're not gonna pay state aid for that. So we have to prorate state aid. And we do have at least two districts that have their state aid prorated because of extracurricular facilities. And then finally, a year ago, uh, the last change they made for capital improvement, if your bond election is held after July 1 of 2022, instead of basing it on the lowest assessed valuation per pupil, it's based on the second lowest and state aid starts at 51% instead of 75%. So the question arises, why did they make that change? Well, remember the slide where Fort Leavenworth was an outlier? Their assessed valuation per pupil for capital improvement to calculate it, we have to round it off to the nearest thousand. Their assessed valuation per pupil is $1,000. The second one is 24% higher than that. So in reality, State aid didn't start until the second district anyway because by law, Fort Leavenworth cannot have a bond election. So we were assigning 75% state aid to a district that can't even have a bond election. Um, and if they could, they couldn't afford it uh, because their valuation is so low. The other problem that causes, uh, because there's so little valuation in Fort Leavenworth, when it increases, it still stays right at about $1,000. Everybody else in the state, as their valuation grows, was getting further and further away from Fort Leavenworth. So while that difference used to be 17%, now it's 24%, 25%, 26%. So districts were losing state aid every year because of the way the formula was written. So they changed it to start at the second lowest assessed valuation per pupil, uh, but they also changed the starting mark, which in reality means everybody's receiving the same percentage state aid as they were before they changed this law. But as we move forward, the gap won't continue to grow quite like it has, if that makes sense. That may be more in the weeds than you wanted to know. But the other thing they included when they changed that law, or they excluded, I should say, virtual students are not counted when you count assessed valuation per pupil. Um, and you can kind of see the logic. Virtual students don't put a lot of strain on your facilities. Questions on the state aid rates? Um, this is when I usually throw in, if all this seems kind of confusing, 
this is job security for Dale and I, so we're not. <laughs> but I will tell you, people who complain it's too confusing, we've made enough changes and tweaks over the years that I don't argue with them anymore. I agree. It's, it's probably too confusing. Just to give you an idea of what the range looks like, uh, property taxes, the general fund, as I said, is set. Everybody levels 20 mil, period. Local option budget ranges across the districts from 3.7 to 32.9. And that's based on their, their property valuation, how much state aid do they receive, and how much of an LOB are they putting in place. Are they using 33% of their general fund? Or are they using 28%? And when, when school boards are concerned about property tax level, this is one of the funds that they, they will kind of maneuver a little bit, maybe to lower the mill if they can, or increase it because we've got some needs and this is the only way we can get their funding for it. Capital outlay uh, is, is maxed. The most you can, any district can levy is eight mills. Uh, the majority do, uh, but there is a range, anywhere from four to eight. Typically, we have one or two that don't have a capital outlay levy. They won't put one in. And then bond and interest varies based on the amount of state aid they receive, which is much less than it used to be. We have a lot more districts that don't qualify for state aid anymore because of the way the formula has changed. And the size of the project, obviously, would make a difference, too. So that's the range of our districts that have bond and interest. Okay, if you'll bear with me for one more <clears throat> really simple concept, funding special education. Um, you're well aware this is a hot topic right now. So spend a little time on how this works. Two primary revenue sources for special education for school districts, state aid and federal aid. There you see the dollar amounts that were in place for the current year. Um, the state appropriated $520 million. Federal funding, and I added plus ESSER, uh, this board directed that part of the uh, ESSER funds that the board had access to would be used for special education to help districts out. So with ESSER added in, that's $132 million. Without ESSER, which will be the case next year, it's typically more like $105 to $108 million. So that number will drop. So the state aid, 520 million, statutory excess cost, as you've heard a few times, is 92%. What that will actually cover is about 76%. And we don't have all the budget numbers in for this year, obviously, so that's an estimate. Federal funds, when the federal passed the IDEA bill, they agreed to pay up to 40%. And they phrased it in language similar to that. They didn't lock themselves in, it will be 40%. But our intention is to pay up to 40%. In reality, it's closer to 16%. So, what's that? 16. So what's that look like in terms of dollars and cents? Well, this year it means we're short about 189 million, I'm sorry, 109 million. Next year, 182 million. And those numbers were both estimated prior to the bill that just passed when the legislature uh, chose to put in an additional seven and a half. So next year's estimate may be off just a little bit. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, it, and you've heard me say it probably several times, we spend, and you'll see this in a minute, about a billion dollars on special education. So an extra seven and a half million, that's a lot of money to you and I. That's less than 1% on what we spend for special education. So the numbers will change a bit, but it's not going to move the needle a great deal. So the question then is, if, if that's the shortfall, how do we make up the difference? Because the services are required. You don't get to decide, I didn't get enough money for special education, so I'm not going to hire a speech-language pathologist this year. Federal law, state law, both require that you provide special education services as written in the IEP. So when school districts don't get enough money in special education funding, you go back to this little chart, where's the money come from? Well, they have to transfer more out of the general fund or the supplemental general fund. And that's money that they would have used for other programs. Uh, so they don't get the short special ed, they have to take it away from some other program and transfer it into the special education fund. 
which is the issue they, they'll discuss. So just review, there's the weighting factors that play into special education funding. Districts are funded for their transportation, their catastrophic expenses, Medicaid, and then the teacher paracategorical aid. So how does that work? How do we decide how much money a district gets? The legislature appropriated $520 million, and this is done, um, these are the statewide numbers. They are reimbursed 80% of their special education transportation costs. Uh, so that only applies if a student's IEP requires transportation. If I'm on a speech language uh, IEP and the services are provided at the school I attend every day and I happen to ride the bus, that's not special education transportation. But if the services that I'm provided are uh, provided somewhere else in another building and I have to ride a bus over there because of my IEP, that's special education transportation. Uh, it will also pay to reimburse for itinerant teachers that have to travel from building to building to building and we have a lot of those around the state when you've got a medium school sized school district of 524 students they share a lot of special education teachers. So those, those costs are also reimbursed. All are reimbursed at 80% of what the district actually spent. They will turn those numbers into us. Does it make sense? Are they already due? Um, so we, we will receive that information from the districts now. At the end of the year, we're finally gonna know how much they spent on transportation this year and be able to reimburse them 80% of those costs. And then in the following year, those numbers will be audited and we'll make adjustments as necessary. Catastrophic aid, again, that's the cost for high need students that require uh, significant services. And those numbers are approximate, uh, but they're pretty close to accurate, what they usually are in a, in a given year. We'll spend about $74 million on the transportation and about $1 million on catastrophic aid. Uh, and sometimes that's for costs for students uh, that have to go to a special school like Heart Spring in Wichita or others around the state. Medicaid replacement is always $9 million. That's set aside. So the money spent on those three areas is totaled. Subtracted from the $520 million, that leaves us $436 million to distribute to districts. That's done based on the number of teachers and paras that they have. They'll also report that to us at the end of the year. How many do we have? So we just simply divide 436 million by 14,125 teachers and paras FTE. And for full-time equivalent purposes, a para is four-tenths of a teacher. So if I've got one teacher and one para, that's 1.4. So I divide that and we come up with categorical aid of $30,867 and that's the amount the district or the interlocal is going to receive per teacher, per FTE teacher. So if I've got 10 FTE teachers and paras, I'm gonna receive $308,670 for categorical aid in addition to whatever I spent on transportation, catastrophic and Medicaid replacement. That's the way special education funding is distributed to school districts. Questions about that? All right, I'm going to launch into this and try to be brief. Because it's been a big question, excess costs, what's 92% of excess costs mean? And how is it determined? <clears throat> how should it be determined and so forth? So I'm going to try to explain how it is determined and you can get lost in the numbers on this real quickly. So we're going to try to use pictures. Um, some, some people will tell you those are terrible colors, uh, but there's a reason for the colors, we'll see in a minute. So on the left-hand side, that represents, that green bar represents the money school districts spend on special education students for general education. So what did it cost just to have math class? What did it cost to have social studies, art class? Um, at risk, were they bilingual? That, expenditure came out of the general fund. It wasn't because of special education services that were needed. And proportionally, those bars are about the right size for statewide determination. And statewide determination is important because that's how the excess cost statute is written. 
It's intended to be a statewide calculation, not a per district calculation. Um, so on the left side, there's the money we spend on special education students specifically for general education. The chart in the middle of the page is how much, there's that $1 billion spent on special education services. So my IEP says I need services for speech language. That money has to be spent out of the special education fund. And that's what you're seeing in the middle bar. How much money in total was spent out of the special education fund? And the different colors represent where did I get that money to spend? So the, the golden color is the federal money I received, the pink color is the state aid, and the gray box is the other money I had to transfer in from the general fund and supplemental general fund to make the full costs. So does that make sense so far? I've got total expenditures for special ed that come out of the special ed fund. I've got general ed expenditures that come out of the general fund or the LOB for my special education students. So to calculate excess cost, there we go. That's happening on the right side now. Um, the, the charts don't quite line up, but that should be the same $1.06 billion total. But now you see there's a green bar in there. The statute says to calculate excess costs, you subtract out the federal money, which is the gold bar, and we also included Medicaid as federal money on the bottom. So you subtract out those two amounts. You subtract out some of the money that was spent from your general fund for general education on the special education students. So that green bar isn't quite as big as the one on the left because you're not taking the full amount of money, but you're still taking money out of the, that you spent out of the general fund and subtracting it from what you spent in the special ed fund, which gets really confusing because you're, I'm taking money out of my left pocket and subtracting it from what I had in my right pocket. That's basically what we're doing here. And then the blue bar is what's left. That's considered excess cost. So you subtract out part of what you spent for general education you subtract out the federal money you received, the blue bar is excess cost, and the state's requirement then is 92% of that blue bar. That's how we come up with excess cost and how the state's portion should be calculated according to law. So it's not intended to cover all of it. Um, and obviously, if any one of those bars at the bottom of the chart is bigger, then the state's version gets smaller. Questions about that? If not, I'm done. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. Thank you, Craig, for the math plus history plus civics lesson. And I'm glad that there's a video so that we can go back and watch it again and get our Absolutely. math straight. Um, thank you, board members, for what was an unusually long meeting. Do you see, though, how if I'm a first-year superintendent, first-year board clerk, this is all statute that drives that. And when I said, when I was going over the board goals and I said, you know, we may look at how do you budget to maximize these, the first few years, you're just trying to budget to make hit this law. You're just trying to make sure you're within the law. So you can see how complicated it is. Well, in meeting yesterday's standards, you got six hours left. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get you your certificate for college credit here in just a little bit. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Craig. That was really helpful. Um, before I adjourn, I have to address uh, item 25B from yesterday. I said I would carry over to today. That is the appointment to the Keisha Board of Directors. I am not ready to make that appointment yet because I need some more information. So that will carry to next month, and I expect that there may be some other committee assignments that will change as well. So we'll visit those during next month's first day, end of the day, agenda item. That's all I've got. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>